Begin. We're going live. We're going live. Apparently, we're live. Oh, wonderful! Hello. Hello, everyone. It's your boy, the late Lord Haven. Welcome back. And uh, his liege lord, uh, Lord Paramount, Hoster Quinn Tully. Did Host I'm not a Hoster Tully. I'm a Muppet Tully, personally. But oh, don't put yourself down like that. I'm I'm pumped for those in season two. I'm that's gonna be fun. I I'm I, I, I can't wait to post like an hour long rant video about how much I hate the Muppet Tullies. I'm gonna do exactly the opposite. I It'll like destroy my career. I wanna be like one of those um That is true, that is kinda of crazy. I wanna I wanna like proper face reveal webcam. I'm going bright red and I'm just screaming into the camera being like It's not funny and then everyone mocks me on Twitter and then uh my channel collapses. But at least I'll be sticking with my principles. Any... Oh, I just can't. I can't. Oh, it's so annoying to me. It's so unfunny. Oh, I hate it. Muppets? No, no, I no. Them. No, I love the Muppets. I, I hate the, the Muppet Tullies. It's such a dumb reference. Oh, no, I was talking about the Muppet Tullies. I think they're great. Oh, Let Martin terrible. have some fun. He's had enough Aegons. He can have some fun. Names. It's just so lame. Oh, it's so... It's going to... It, it took me out of the book. Think about what it's going to do to viewers. They're invested. They're enjoying themselves. Then some motherfucker called Kermit comes up, and he's like, yeah, we need to go to a King's Landing. It's ridiculous. That's pretty good. I didn't know you had a Kermit. <laughs> I kind of made it up on the spot there. Okay, plane going overhead uh, as usual. It'll be useful for season two. It certainly will. Everybody, my, my review's coming out. I support the Muppet Tullies. I am, I am in your corner, people. Oh, that's ridiculous. Let me do a poll then. So we're starting off this with a poll. Hello, everyone, by the way. We, we're having a little argument while you're coming in. Um, are the Muppet Tullys uh, based or cringe? That will be my question. Everyone vote in uh, the chat. And there's only one right answer. You should know what that is. There we go. The poll is out. Get voting. Okay, I, I've said this you before. Do, I'm okay with Grover Tully. I'm okay with that. They name dropped him season one Grover. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I've heard rumors that Oscar Tully might be in season two. That's Oscar. I'm okay I've with also that. Heard that that's fine. That's a name. I better not hear Kermit or Elmo, or I will I will throw stuff at my TV. I do. Those are the two more egregious. I'll admit that. But Grover and Oscar. That's kind of cute, Kermit, right? If I recall, Kermit's semi-important. I can't not have Kermit. Story, Kermit is. Oh. There is only one Kermit in pop culture, and it's a frog. There's no other c acceptable Kermit. Know. We got a president named Grover. That's acceptable. Yeah, I'm okay with Grover. I'm okay with Oscar. Uh, you know what? Change Elmo to, like, Elmar, because there is an Elmar like Frey. Like, Elmo, like A. -L yeah. Have a little nod to it. I don't, know, I don't know how you could change Kermit to make it sound similar and, like, reference it, but still... Like how do you how do you make Kermit a kind of medieval? With like E T T at the end, like Ed Tully. Kermit, Kermit Tully. If they pronounce it differently, exactly. maybe. Well, it looks like seventy nine percent of people are on the correct side of history here, and I appreciate you. That's ridiculous. Thank you to the twenty one percent who had the courage and the spine to vote cringe. Yeah, <laughs> to, well, it's okay to be wrong. To speak the truth. Shout out to the 60 odd people jumping in expecting us to talk about schemas. <laughs> We're this is rambling. Actually, this is a secret Muppet live stream. This is. Who's your favorite Muppet? My favorite Muppet? It's gotta be Kermit. There is a correct answer. I just like it. I mean. Kermit? That's a, that's a vanilla answer, isn't it? That's, I'm a big. No, you know what? I'm a big Gonzo guy. I respect the Gonzo. I was gonna say Gonzo. Gonzo's my favorite. Did you ever see that movie, The um, Muppets in Space? I feel I have some vague memory from like, like early childhood the, of seeing it, but I don't recall anything specifically. The big plot is that no one understands uh, what Muppet Gonzo is meant to be, and then he finds out he's an alien. I love that movie. I definitely remember that. I love that movie as a kid. The one, the only Muppet movie I concretely remember is The Christmas Carol, but that's it. Oh, that's a banger too. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I used it's to have on, adaptation on VHS. I used to have like the old show um but sesame street that's a different animal we, d we don't really have that in the uk i didn't grow up on sesame street yeah, wait oscar isn't oscar 
Oh, right? oh, oh, it's kind of mixing metaphors, isn't it? It's yeah, Muppets and that Christmas is it. Green. That's true. In fact, Kermit is the only Muppet of the Muppet Tullys. All the others are it's Sesame literally Street. Literally unwatchable. I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up with with no Elmo. I didn't grow up with no Oscar or Grover. I grew up with the one and only, the Green Man himself, Kermit. I had some. I had a mix of both. There was a fair bit of Sesame Street on TV when I was a wee lad. My uh, party trick. Puppet Treasure Island is pretty great. Somebody in the chat says I, I agree with that. My party trick. Any is, Treasure uh, Island adaptation is pretty great automatically, though. I think I remember that one too. There's one where they went to Manhattan. Puppets take Manhattan. I've I've remembered the name. I don't remember anything else. Should we not talk about the Muppets for this entire stream? We should. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, t- we've only gone up in views, though. I know. It's there hasn't been a di- there hasn't been a dip. Them. We've gained viewers as we've been rambling about the Muppets. That's insane. Maybe we should change focus. I'm a Muppet channel now. What I was trying to say earlier is that my party trick is doing the impression of Kermit sneezing. Do you want to hear it? Absolutely. Ah, 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 I'm going to sneeze. There we go. Okay, let's begin. Um, oh, actually, no. Uh, let me... Uh, Pub- publicize this on Twitter. Let the people know that we stream in. We're talking about puppets. Seventy people watching. What are you doing with well, your lives? The lives? poll has remained open for four minutes, and it is still at eighty percent based, which is correct. Ridiculous. This is a mostly American audience, so I'm surprised so many people are watching this at uh, eleven a.m. Eastern time in America on a Monday. On a Monday? That's that's fair. I have off from classes today, which is why I'm here, but. No. Okay, I'm post- posting it on... Merciful today only. There we go. How's the stream looking? Get up. Oh, it's looking good. Okay, shall we actually begin then? Okay, let's do the classic intros. Welcome to the stream. Today we're going to be ranking every schema, which is a lie. We'll probably be ranking some, but hopefully we can kind of jump between channels and make this a multi-part live stream. We'll be not just book characters, but also show characters, because show Tyrion... And Book Tyrion are two completely different beasts altogether. Um, before we begin, check out Quinn the GN's channel if you haven't already. Give him a sub. Subscribe to me if you haven't. Um, or if you don't want to, you, you don't have to. Uh, like the video to help it spread. Um, if you have any super chats, if you want Quinn or I to answer any questions or bring up any theories or just say dumb stuff out loud, feel free it supports the channel, which is my job because I'm a crazy person. It's still Quinn's job. He's he's trying to be a lawyer or some some shit. He's he's I'm go- dying. It's great. He's gonna be the Saul Goodman a, to my uh, procedure midterm on Wednesday. He's the Saul Goodman to my Walter White. Yeah, correct. I'm gonna fuck everything up, is what I'm saying. Alt Shift X is Gus because he's 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 like established. He's built everything up from the it's ground, survived, isn't it? And I'm gonna ruin everything. <laughs> okay. Did I? I think I saw Boomler in the chat. He's one of my amazing patrons, by the way. Uh, Boomler accused you of being British. He said, instead of doing accused homework... Me of being British? Instead of what? doing... He said, and I quote, instead of doing homework, I'm watching two British guys with hot accents talk about Muppets. Oh. Now... Yeah, I've watched a lot of Love Island, but I don't think I'm British. To be fair, he's, he's Polish. We all sound the same. Maybe. Oh, fair enough. And also, you're not one to talk. You thought Alt Shift X was British, so... I thought I think everybody's British if they don't have an American accent. <laughs> in my defense, but I mean, what is outside of America except British people and Russians? That's a great point. Th- that's the only accents you hear in American cinema, other than American accents. Exactly. Okay, that's enough. Is Gladys Lalo then? Yeah, that's probably it. I haven't seen Better Call Saul, so I don't actually. But I know you that that's a character. Oh, Better Call Saul, I like better than Breaking Bad. It's I've excellent. I, I hear that. I hear that so often, and I refuse to agree, even though I haven't seen it. What? Every single it's person so who brings it up, no, no, not that it's good. So every single person says, "Oh, it's better than Breaking Bad," and I'm just like, I, I refuse. Think I think it's my all-time favorite show. That's incredible. Personally. It's the only. It's the first show that I ever like watched the first episode as it was airing and watched the finale as it was airing every episode live. I, I, I watched, after I binged Breaking Bad, I like started season one and I couldn't get through it because it was too slow. Valid. Season one of Breaking Bad's a little... Wait, Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul? Uh, Better Call Saul, I couldn't... I, I finished uh-huh. Breaking Bad, I couldn't get into Better Call Saul. I did the first few episodes, it was too slow for me. Uh, it's a slow burn. I like <laughs> it. 
<laughs> someone said Gli- like, we should rank some steamers. Yes, yeah. Someone said Glidus is Mike, which made me laugh. Yeah. That's- <laughs> okay, that's enough. And oh my god, we're so talk about a tangent. All right. I I would like to make a case for something. Just looking at this list to start. Go ahead. I think that we should split show Littlefinger into two different people. Because I Interesting. Think that would be accurate to what happened. You want to split that, split Aiden Gillen in half? Yes. I would also be open to doing the same thing to Tyrion, because I think the two Ooh. characters are completely different in seasons one through four and five through eight. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, oh, we so will do... We should determine... In, in ranking these guys, are we ranking them based, like, on scheming ability, well, is what I assumed, yes? Yes, yes. It's how competent they are as a schemer, how intelligent their plans are, not just short-term, but long-term, right? So someone like Tywin Lannister, you could say, short-term, you know, he's getting his, he's becoming more powerful, he's, he's establishing his family's legacy, but long-term, he's kind of screwing himself over. Exactly. I, I, I will say... I don't... Also, for all the people at home, we do have a tier above S, you just can't see it. That is squarely reserved for Mace the Ace, but we figured we didn't even need to address that. Oh, so. yeah. It goes without saying, almost. Um, I, I, I will say... I'd say instead of splitting the show characters in half, I think we just put that into our... into our final verdict, you know. So season that's, one to four that's... Tyrion could be, like... At the top, but then season five to eight drags him down, and then he he could end up balancing out. So who do we want to start with? We think. Um, honestly, I think Tyrion could be a good starting point. Okay. Just because yeah, he's a good idea. he's a classic schemer. He's like the most schemerous, schemery POV character that we have in the books. Um, but he's also not one of the you know background in the shadow masterminds he's sort of um mm-hmm. he's smart and he's out there but he is he is competent he's more competent than cersei but he's not quite as cunning as littlefinger so i think he's a good starting point um do you want to start a show or book Being more competent than cersei is not a very high bar that's true oh i'm ending the poll by the way oh smart 80 percent saying that the muppet tullies are based well 80 percent correct that's good ridiculous okay um, book or show? What should we do? Uh, let's start with book, I'd say. That's what I've been more familiar with recently, at least. Okay, so let's start with little book Tyrion. There he is. So, do you want to you start off? Sure. I think that just looking at the list and looking at the other characters we have on it, my thought would be, like, middle high. I think Tyrion thinks a lot of his own abilities, but I think if we look at his actual track record in the books, we only have one book where he's really getting anything done in like a scheming capacity, and that's Clash. I think that any other book, he's either completely on the back foot or just getting outplayed by a bunch of better players, typically. But I do think he is a character who has a better future ahead of him than some of the others. I think that he very much is starting to come into his own. I think we see at the end of Dance, he kind of begins reasserting himself in the role of a schemer. Specifically with uh, some of the things he does with the uh, Second Sons, I believe it is. That's uh, yeah. actually the beginning of Wins, not at the end of Dance. But I think that overall Tyrion, I would, I'd say Book Tyrion is a solid B tier mm. in my eyes. What do you think? B sounds good. B does sound good because, like I said, he fulfills yeah. that that middle ground, right, where he is um, he's more competent than the sort of the more blustering buffoonish characters, um, but he's not quite to the level of the masterminds hiding in the shadows um you know some some of my favorite chapters without question are Tyrion in a clash of kings and a storm of swords i remember yeah in clash they, it was definitely my favorite every time i turn the page i'd be like i hope it's Tyrion. i hope it's Tyrion. and when it was i'd like fist pump the air, i'd be like yes because it was so fun watching him uh, scheme in king's landing um and then in storm Actually, of- a bit of a hot take i think go for it i saw somebody like talking about their like favorite characters in each book uh, a few days ago. I'm not the biggest on Tyrion in Storm. Oh. I think his chapters are very hit or miss. I think he's got some very good ones, but I think there's some pacing issues. Fair enough. It's been a while since I've read Storm. I think well, I think my mind kind of meshes Tyrion in Clash and Storm 
together just because he's in King's Landing during both. That's fair. But the plot, his plot is very, very different. But yeah, he manages yeah. to rise through the ranks and like uh, kick out Kingsguard he doesn't like. He kicks out uh, Pycel. He accumulates power. He, he gets uh, allies in charge of the City Watch and in charge of the Lannister Guard and he gets rid of Jano Slint and so on. But then he does lose Even all that. his friends at court. Powerful. <laughs> Despite his powerful friends, he manages to usurp Jano Slint. But Who then, are his powerful friends? Um, Alard Deem and uh, maybe s- someone else. No one. Basically, no one. I um, know he knew the faceless men. <laughs> uh, but Tyrion, he then loses all of that in Storm. He kind of falls out of power. Um. And then, like you said, he he after he gets over his depression, he continues scheming in Essos, like not just with the Sellsword companies, but even when he's talking with Young Griff and sort of manipulating him. I was going to say, I think that might be his best scheme to date: the manipulation of Young Griff, at least in terms of the overall impact on the story as a whole. And it's 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 fueled by uh, bitterness and hatred and a desire for revenge. Mm-hmm. Um, so like Tyrion. Yeah, Ty- Tyrion wants young Griff to go to Westeros and sort of rain fire um, mm-hmm. because of the way he was he was treated by the nobility of King's Landing, basically, and by his family. Uh, long, long, long term. So long term, in the first few books, his plan is basically to cement his own power and his family's power, even though he kind of hates his family. He's sort of unquestioningly, okay... Let, let, let's preserve the status quo in King's Landing. Let's defend against Stannis. Let's make sure we're defeating Rob Stark and so on. Um, when he moves to Essos, it is more about. It's a lot more. It's a lot more sort of a, a more of a chaos is a ladder approach. Once he goes into exile, would you agree? I was honestly thinking it's if it's most similar to anybody. I think his plan once in exile is pretty similar to Duran Martell, just seeking mm. revenge through fire and blood. Yeah, but it's a seeking re- revenge, but also uh, using, so, sort of um, improvising as he goes along, you know. True, so kind of opposite to Duran in that specific element. Yeah, yeah, Duran less sitting and waiting and more. Anything. It's the same motives as Duran, but it's the method, yeah, the methods of Littlefinger, sort of, let, let's exploit what's happening around me to get what I want, and presumably he will eventually meet Daenerys and then... I assume become her hand like in the show and uh, be the the evil villainous dwarf dripping poison into her ears. Devil on her shoulder. Mm. I do also, I really like his Sivas abilities as kind of a way to look at his scheming because he's really not very good at it if we look at when he plays, but he's able to like bluff and convince people he's winning and that's how he gets people to do things. It's amazing that there's been... Aegon and it has that with Ben Plum. Yeah, it's amazing there hasn't been an attempt to... Um... You know, make money off of Sivas. <laughs> Some, have someone... Martin was offered that, and I think he turned it down. Oh, did he? Oh, did he not want there to be yeah, concrete I rules? Yeah, my research for my Sivas video. Um, the way I read that is he didn't really want to set the rules in stone, because, like, what if he wants to do something as, like, a metaphor in a future book, and he wants some freedom of movement that he might not have if he yeah, solidifies that's... rules? I don't know. Maybe, but... I, I... I think if you can sell Sivas without it necessarily being canon to the books, in the same way that you can buy Gwent cards from The Witcher, but the rules of the real-life Gwent are not the same as the rules in the video game. I'm sure we can make a Sivas set. We know all the pieces. Exactly. Sivas livestream, I keep telling you. Millions of views. I am incredibly bad at chess, so <laughs> I would not be very good at that. I don't think I've played chess since I was a child. Uh, somebody asked in the chat, did Sivas exist before Dance? It first comes about in Feast, so it's an oh. idea he came up with uh, just prior to those two books. Um, I did just make a video about this, and I need to make that knowledge useful somehow, so I'm expositing here. Check out Quinn the GM's channel, but don't subscribe to him because I'm trying to overtake him. Oh, okay. It's nearly been a That's year fine. of catching up to this boy. Okay, um, I'd say B. I agree with you on B. I would agree with B. Okay. You can rest there, my boy. My heterochromatic friend. Okay, shall we move on to show Tyrion then? 
I am good with that. Do you want to take show Tyrion? Um, I I can't think of anything I'd like to do less than take show Tyrion. It oh, it, it, it it pains me too much. No, of course. Um, so right, where do we begin? Let's start with the good stuff. <laughs> so at the start, show Tyrion is very similar to how he is in the books, in the sense of he is a he is a very smart man. He's bookish. He's well read. He thinks ahead. He knows how to consolidate power, and he knows how to scheme. And I think one of the best uh, scenes in season two, maybe in the entire show, uh, is is um, the one where he's trying to um, find out who the, the rat is, find out who's feeding information to Cersei. And so he gives different information to Littlefinger, Varys, and uh, Pycelle about uh, who he wants to marry Marcella off to. And it's based on a chapter in the book although it's slightly different from what i remember it's he tells was it he tells Pycelle that he wants to marry Mycella to Duran Martel uh sorry to Triste Martel uh he tells either Littlefinger and or Varys that he wants to marry Mycella off to um Robert Aaron it was specifically i did rewatch this episode more recently it mm-hmm. was uh, he told Varys that she was going to marry her to uh, Theon mm-hmm. and told Littlefinger it was Robin Aaron mm-hmm. yeah and in the book uh, the, in the show the Theon one is made up for the show because from what i remember in the i think because they wanted to streamline it like, so like i'm going to marry her off to this person this person this person whereas in the book it's um he doesn't offer to marry her to Theon. He, it's, he offers to marry Tommen off to someone. I can't remember who exactly. But I can see in the show they were like, I okay, let's just, let's just have him talk about Marcella and not Tommen because it would jump around too much. Um, and that's a great scene. And you have so many other great scenes like how he, um, he grills out <laughs> um, Jano Slint and sends him to the wall. Um, how he... How he uh, plotting to save the city with the pyromancers and so on, the the exchanges he has with Varys. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and this sort of continues into season three. And um, season four, of course, he spends most of season four locked up, but he's still, he's still his classic witty self. Um, and there are even, you know, what I like is... The D and D were good at throwing in some like show only lines that were great Tyrion lines, and you kind of assume they're in the book, but they're not. Like the one where Oberyn Mar- before Oberyn goes to fight the Mountain, um, you know they're talking about oh he's a huge man, he's so big and powerful, and Oberyn says well size doesn't matter when you're flat on your back, and Tyrion mutters thank the gods, which is actually a, a show only that that's a show only line, but that's the sort of thing you would see in the book. They're like perfect. Um, but yeah, and, but then that's sort of the that that's that's the Tyrion we all know and love. Um, n- not exactly as he is in the book. He's not as villainous, of course. It, it, the show does massively whitewash him. He's a lot more heroic um, and not as morally ambiguous. So we miss out on scenes like um, what was it? There's a, a a bard, a singer in King's Landing who's making songs about him and attempts to blackmail him or something. And so Tyrion basically has Bronn, you know, kill him like a hitman. Uh, and so he's and he's a lot of, in a bowl of brown if I recall. bowl of brown yes um feed him to the population uh yep yeah so he's a lot more he's a lot more villainous in the books and of course this this dark streak um gets gets darker and darker uh, as the books go on whereas in the show because they didn't intru- they didn't introduce that dark streak they didn't seed that and then they decided not to seed it in any other series so there was nothing that grew out of it he just stayed as um you know a good person ultimately a flawed but good person as opposed to a kind of anti-hero transforming into a villain because i have to remember it was an old interview wasn't it like in the 90s where george r martin said that he views Tyrion's story as an as a villain origin story he was like oh it's always fun to write the villain's origin story so he could he may have changed his mind but he sort of sees Tyrion as a villain and then in the show we have season five onwards, right, where um, he just he just he does sort of transform into a new character. It feels like they didn't know what to do with him, and so he spends most of season five aimlessly floating and being pulled and pulled along towards Daenerys, right, to have them meet up. 
during that time, yeah, he has his usual witticisms and quips, and you know he he uh, rides his way out of an interaction with pirates who want to cut his head off um, by basically saying, "Hey, look, you know, I, I'm a dwarf. I'd make a I'd make a good slave. I'd be a funny fighter, right? You could get money out of me, uh, entertaining, blah blah blah." But we do miss out on his manipulations of a young Griff and of the sellsword companies that you know the wind blown and so on. And then I'd say I do have to restrain myself from talking about this plot line because my anger for omitting John Connington will overcome me. <laughs> the stream will not recover from the five hour John Connington rant. Correct. Um and then we reach season six. So we have four seasons of Schemy Tyrion. We have season five where he's okay, but he's doesn't really have anything to do. And then season six onwards is when he sort of becomes idiot Tyrion for some inconceivable reason. It's like they didn't know what to do with him and all he does is constantly make really stupid mistakes over and over and over and then keeps getting rewarded for those mistakes. So he's the Hand of the King and he tries to rule Marine in Daenerys' absence, right? Um, and what does he plan? He plans something with the Great Masters about like phasing out slavery gradually. Uh, which is a plot point that doesn't really go anywhere. Um, there's that awful, awful scene, maybe one of the worst in the entirety of the show, where he's like telling jokes with Masande and Grey Worm, he, like about a fly in his wine, and he's like, "It's ter- it's awful." It's it's. I remember watching it, just being like, "What is this character doing?" He's like sitting around doing nothing, um, just. Even the performance, I, I I know this is kind of going beyond him being a schemer and more like the downfall of the character, but even it almost felt like Peter Dinklage sort of wasn't as invested season five onwards. Like the moment he grew that beard, it just, it did feel like he he wasn't putting that much into the role. He's, Tyrion just kind of became a sort of annoying little um, wisecracking comic relief character designed to sell mugs and t-shirts. I wasn't really doing anything in the plot except making mistakes, you know. And then season seven rolls round, and then we have him again, constantly bring saying dumb stuff like, "Oh no, don't take King's Landing. We're going to take Casterly Rock," um, which then that itself fails. Oh no, no, you know we have to save Cersei. We, we, um, I know. Let's capture White beyond the Wall and present it to her, and then he somehow, somehow they think that's going to work, and then she pretends that she is going to side with them and then she doesn't and all this stuff and it's just really he's just mistakes after just mistake after mistake he's always disagreeing with Daenerys um and always telling her to do I I don't know feel free to jump in whenever you want by the way I don't want to hog the conversation um Oh no, you're good. I'm just reeling from the re- real. Uh, sorry, reeling from the realization that he grew a beard between season four and five. I never realized that. Oh, you you I think didn't. I just thought he always had it. No, no. I mean, there's a, like a distinct difference. Or at between... least I think I my association with it is I think it came about when the scar did for some reason. Mm, but yeah. I just forget that Tyrion didn't have a beard in early. No, that, there's that beardless Tyrion and bearded Tyrion are two different characters, arguably giving different oh, performances. 100%. He just, Bearded Tyrion is like kind of bored, making um, witty remarks and then telling people to do dumb stuff that they either ignore or they do and then it goes wrong and then he doesn't really face any consequences for it. He just, he just becomes stupid. That's why it was a big meme when the show's coming out. That everyone was like, Tyrion is just dumb now. Um, and you could say, okay, yes, in terms of telling... Uh, Daenerys not to attack King's Landing and, you know, wanting to do the whole white hunt and trusting Cersei, even though, and then she betrayed them, that all of this is based on emotion, right? He's and his emotions get the best of him. But it's like, why? Why is he so desperate to save Cersei when all she's done has been <laughs> horrible towards him? Like, it just, it just felt like, I don't know, he's just constantly making mistakes and being dumb. And, and then season eight rolls around and Again, he doesn't really have... If we are objectively ranking his capacity as a schemer, Mm -hmm. he does name the new king. He does. Which seems big in terms of, like, accomplishments. Okay, that's true. So we can write off... We're just looking at it on paper without context. We can write off 5, 6, and 7 as him just either doing nothing or being stupid. Season 8, I don't think he makes... 
Oh, I will say there is one decision he makes about hiding the men and the women and the crippled in the crypts of Winterfell during the, the battle. Crypt? Yeah. yeah, to the point where even the actor... That interview with Dinklage, like, in, after the episode is one of my favorite things. He's awkwardly like, ooh, why did I do that? That's not smart. <laughs> and he's saying it in, like, a jokey way, but it's like, yeah, no, why? why? Tyrion, why? Yeah, why did that happen? And then... Yeah, and then at the very end of the season... You know, he he does. Love the he, prisoner named the king. Yeah, yeah, he does. Does you have a point there? Despite being a prisoner, and close to being executed, and technically being you know a traitor, he names the new king and then becomes the hand of that king. So he that's the most powerful position he's been in since the story began. He becomes hand of the king. Pretty impressive. So it's a mixed bag. Yeah. I I kind I of think Tyrion's very smart. <laughs> wow. I, you know like what? He's never made a bad decision ever. You talking S tier? I, I think above that. I think he's <laughs> here at this point. He's so smart. Let's just put him off the board. I'm definitely not going to drag issue, him all the way down here. My issue with like ranking him is between D and E. Mm. Because like looking at this, I don't know if he's D because of the earlier seasons, but also looking at this list, I don't know who else would be in E. Yeah, me neither. Um, that's true. See, I would say, I would say he's on par. First four seasons, he's on par with Book Tyrion. He's not the same character, but him being villainous isn't. Part. Yeah, him being villainous isn't. Him being more villainous in the book hasn't really got anything to do with how much of a schemer he is. It's just there's a bit of a difference in morality between the book version and show version. Um, season five, six, seven. He is arguably. Arguably, he is E, because all he does is make the wrong choice over and over and over and say dumb stuff. I would say inarguably. Um, but then at the end, which sort of places him somewhere between C and D, but then in the end, he does become the Hand of the King. Um, so you could say he's a good schemer there. Sure, the, the plot was stupid, but within that plot, he made it work, right? He became Hand of the I King. I would like to make two... Two good suggestions from chat. Um, Go on. Iverson says stretch him across all tiers, which I think <laughs> is apt. Hmm. Uh, and Elliot says that he has smashed the Beatles tier, which I also agree with. Oh god, that makes me want to put him down to E. That's one of the, that's another of the yeah. that I consider to be the worst scenes, along I with. I think that might be my least favorite scene. Along with the um, the whole joke scene in Marine, the one in it, what you know what I suspect. I suspect that that scene, because that scene feels so like random and rushed and unnecessary, and just stupid and insulting. It feels like it was originally meant to be something else, and I reckon that scene was going to be Tyrion bringing Tysha up again, while Jamie sort of silently listens oh. on and wants to tell him something but doesn't, and then that would come back at the end. Because I think they I think did. You're a, absolutely right. I think they did originally plan the Taisha reveal. Oh. But the director of season 10 like pushed back against it and was like, I'm not a big fan of this for his character. I don't know why the director has a say, right? But then D&D kind of capitulated and were like, yeah, you're right. Let's let's end it on a happy note, which then, of course, derailed his character completely. But that scene... Let's end on the happy note of Patricide. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it's such... And, uh, and murder of his former lover. Um, but it's such an out-of-nowhere scene that it does feel like they were like, oh, shit, we need to replace this with something now that we've omitted the Taisha reveal and it doesn't make sense for him to bring her up again. Let me think. Uh, okay, yeah, let's have let's have a scene where he they talk about a made-up cousin and let's have a scene dedicated to calling another author an idiot, basically, because he doesn't like our show. It's just very bizarre. Um, I I would say pretty solid D or E. I don't know what I'm, I'd say maybe D. I'm going to go D just because those early seasons, we do need to take them into account. And I, I can think of one character that I might say is uh, F tier, but I'll get to that later. We don't we don't actually have an F tier. <laughs> I've, oh, E tier, whatever. E tier, yeah. I, I copied and pasted one that doesn't that is, have an it F. It is kind of American school system, no Fs anymore. Fair enough. F for fail, yeah. E again, I will. I can easily um, pull in more characters if we make our way through these. Or if there's a character you want to talk about who isn't on the screen, we I, I could pop them in. I should have the art for them. Um, but, yeah, there we go. I think that's fair. Uh, oh, we have a super chat. So, thank you for the super Ooh. chat from Tantalus, who says, 
Best schemer is obviously Ned Stark. Step 1. Honourably sacrifices himself to start a war. Step 2. Things happen. Step 3. His family controls Westeros. Yo, that's a good point. Ned warged Joffrey. If we're talking... That's why Joffrey killed Ned. Oh my god. If we're talking... It wasn't the pigeons. If we're talking show Ned, then yeah, that man manipulated events to have his son on the throne of the south and his daughter on the throne of the north and his bastard nephew arguably king of the wildlings beyond the wall holy shit ned was a genius we'll find out in the show the snow spin-off show we will the snow sh- i've not heard anything about that since the initial i've also heard nothing and i really hope it doesn't happen i i i have a feeling it won't i i don't know yeah, I mean they've already got Dunkin' Egg going too. I'm su- so I'm kind figure. of I'm kind of surprised they even announced it because it's not like there are any leaks or anything. It was kind of rumored and then Gurm announced it, which I feel like he was given the green light by HBO. But I feel like I don't know. It is kind of strange. I I think we would have heard more about it if it were going to happen. Yeah, because it would be like a, a bigger thing in terms of like all these spinoff shows aren't directly connected to the original at least, and I think like. Yeah, and well, no at least one for the masses that aren't as yeah. into it, having the main guy back would probably be a big thing. I, well, I just don't. There's no story they could tell that would interest me. Yeah, I I would agree with that. Like even if it's a oh we want it to wrap up stuff the show didn't wrap up or you know George R. R. Martin uh, get, told Kit Harrington the you know the real ending of the books and they're gonna be close. It's like no, I don't want that. I don't want that in a snow show, you know. Yeah, I don't want anything in a no show. I don't really like Game of Thrones, Jon Snow. Um, yeah, so let's jump onto new character. There are like twenty. Yes, I had I have a list of like twenty schemers we could talk about from bo- both hey, historical and the books. It's a good list. Yeah, I think I think we should. Who are we going to next? I pick Tyrion. You pick Tyrion. Um, honestly, hmm. Let's go historical. I'm going to go with okay. Otto Hightower. My man Otto, I love him. Do we have book and show Otto there? We do indeed. There's a show Otto chilling in the corner. Uh, so I don't know oh, how different the two of those are. Yeah. A, in my memory. So I might rank show Otto a little higher. That's a good point. What? What? Yeah. What, because we know more about Show I mean, Otto. Like, There's more detail the about Show Otto. That we know that... Exactly, because we have all that gray area from Fire and Blood being Fire and Blood. Um, whereas Show Otto does pretty directly do a bunch of things. Another thing to bear in mind is that we know the full life story of Book Otto, whereas Show Otto, we only know season one. This is true. And he ended season one in a very high position of power, so... So what do we know about Book Otto? He, did, he engineered the entire season, pretty much, in like he did. Rhaenyra air. We're suggesting that he did. Um, so he was kind of playing chess against himself. <laughs> so let's start with Bo- Book Otto because this should be quite short, I think. So Book Otto um, becomes Hand of the King. Question before we get into it. Oh, sure. Are we doing spoilers? Oh, that's a good point. Um, for the people watching. Oh, that's a good point. You know what? I think. Go ahead. I think we should be good without spoilers. Yeah. I think we're, I think we're probably... I don't think we miss a ton. I think yes. most of what we're talking about should be non-spoilery. Yeah. Let's go no Hot D spoilers. Or... I, I'd agree. Or we leave the Hot D ones till last, and then we have the last chunk of the video be spoilers. Ooh. That is tempting. Maybe we do that. Yeah. Okay, let's leave Hot D till last. Okay. Because then yeah, people right. don't have to, like, jump through, and I don't have to put in chapters and stuff, because I'm lazy. Okay, yeah. in that case, um, I want to go... I, I think we can do a quick one here. My thought is Illyrio would be on the quicker side. Illyrio Mapatis. Let's do Illyrio. So... At least, like, I, I show Illyrio <laughs> appears in, like, three episodes yeah. in season one, and then his house appears in season five, and he never appears again. What is the deal with show Illyrio? So, because uh, it's Aegon, that's the issue. They cut Aegon exactly. So, they so within the context of the show, within the canon of the show, who is this man? Just to quickly go through Show Illyrio first. Cheesemonger. So, he's a cheesemonger. He um, 
he gives Daenerys dragons, he marries her off to uh Khal Drogo. He is in that scene in the in the um the dungeons under King's Landing where he it converses True. with Varys. And during that speech they are talking and then he about turns into a house. He does trans he does he will he is last seen a house. He's la- he's like last Billy Atardo in the Sopranos. I haven't seen it. Ugh. Ugh. Too, too many great shows I haven't seen. But yeah, so within the canon of the show, basically he is a Targaryen loyalist. He wants Viserys and Daenerys to return home. He's allied with Varys. Varys goes on to side with Daenerys, so in the show Varys was always with Daenerys. Uh, he uses Illyrio's house in season five, which implies that they're on good terms, but then Illyrio vanishes. So he's just a random guy whose plan is to sell Daenerys to Khal Drogo and get an army for Viserys so that they can invade Westeros. In terms of... Which he accomplished. Which he did actually accomplish. Um, Long term, yeah. Uh, Honestly, I don't know. C... I was thinking B. B. Because he has one scheme and he achieves it, (laughs) basically. Yeah, he, he did good. Um, but and I, I feel bad that he had to get like so badly cut because of Aegon, but like uh, they could they could have included him though. They, they could did, they so clearly wanted to set it up in like season one. Yeah, but... they, they, they could have, even if they cut Aegon, they could have brought him back in season five and be like, "Oh, Varys, my friend, Tyrion, let me reveal the truth. We're backing Daenerys and yeah. we're Targ loyalists." And then Illyrio is just like part of Daenerys's camp. Uh, why just completely remove the, him? The fact that they brought back his house, but not his actor, makes me wonder if there was like some, I don't know, if the actor didn't want to come back or didn't have conflict the or something. I think you easily you yeah. easily could have recast him though, because he's in two scenes in season one. He's in two episodes. Right. Like you easily could have just cast Dye a fat hair. a could fat man with a beard, and people would have been like, book readers would have been like, oh, that's Illyrio. Show show watchers casuals would have been like, I don't know who that is. Like they wouldn't even remember him from season one, you know. That is true. Um, so we put him in B because his plan is to get a Targaryen on the throne, and then he actually he doesn't really succeed in that, right? Because Daenerys does return, but then her rule fails. She touches the throne. She touches the throne. She never sits it. She dies, and Viserys gets killed by the Dothraki army anyway, and that Dothraki army never invades Westeros. So actually, he's a failure. You manipulated me, Quinn. I was like going along with it, but no, his whole plan uh, fails. You've uncovered my scheme. His pl- his plan fails, and he doesn't even exploit his plan to get any sort of power. He just disappears. He turns into a house. So honestly, I might even put him at E. I'd say C. I think you've convinced me on C. C? Okay. But his whole plan fails. He only has one plan in the show, and it fails. It's have the Dothraki army invade Westeros, get a Targaryen on the throne. He fails both short-term and long-term. Looking at all of these characters, all of the show characters, you could say the same thing about all of them. And that's I, actually that's a good point. There's no point going lower when there are other characters that deserve to be lower. And also, if we're considering like end state of plans to be like that important, then Tyrion should be an A tier. Like that's a Tyrion. good point. Okay, okay, fine. His his one scheme, he he. Okay, sure. He's C. He C C C. He's in the middle. It's inoffensive. The fact that we've spent this yeah. long talking about Show Illyrio is actually ridiculous. I did think this would be a short. <laughs> this is section. this is the state of the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom. We're we're debating how much of a skilled schemer Show Illyrio is. This this is what happens when Winds is not released. Okay, let's move on to a more interesting Book character. Illyrio, I think I can make a strong case for A tier. I love Book Illyrio. He's honestly one of my favorite characters. He doesn't appear much, but I do love his appearances. I I love the way he's described. I love how he's this big, fat, um, perfumed, uh, grotesquely oiled, um, but almost sort of gentle and lightweight, eloquent man who who rose up from nothing to become this super rich um, merchant cheesemonger. It's just really interesting to me. He always interested me in the first book, and then he vanished. And then when he reappeared in dance, I was like, oh shit, this guy. I love that. Um, we do have a super chat oh. that I quite like. Uh, okay, let's dive into the super chat. Uh, yeah, before we jump into Illyrio. Um, thank you for the super chat from The Pink Letter Writes, who says, 
Reverse Night Lamp. Hostine Frey is so stupid a commander, he will try flanking Stannis over the ice, accidentally walking right into the actual camp. <laughs> Reverse Night Lamp. I think we should put Hostine Frey on this list. That's incredible. That's an S tier theory. I dig it. I love that, that he's like, no, we'll go around. <laughs> and he defeats Stannis' army by accident. The pink letter is true. The pink letter is real. Hostine Frey slew Stannis single handedly. Host- Hostine so, yeah, is Azor Ahai. Illyrio, yeah. Illyrio, I think, I think should be A tier, honestly. A tier for Aegon, because I think that his plan is kind of going perfectly based on everything we've seen. On, on one hand, yes. On another hand, there's that famous quote which says, the fat man's plans change uh, with the, the moon or whatever. But I can't remember what the exact quote is. The fat at... man's plans, the one that change every time the moon turns? Yes, that's it. Because Somebody in the Golden Company said that. Because, okay, so clearly, the, the, the problem is from a meta perspective, George did not even come up with the Blackfires until A Storm yeah. of Swords. So in the first book, Illyrio's plan is very much get Viserys on the throne. Get a Targa- Targaryen restoration is his plan, and presumably Varys' plan. See, I don't, I don't agree with that personally. Okay. I think that Martin always planned on there being some other, quote unquote, Targaryen claimant. I just think it was a bright flame initially. I think he planned that second book onwards. I don't think he planned that in the first book. Maybe you're right because I do remember them appearing and for the first time. I do, I do agree. You're right that I, I think. The first book. I do agree with you on the on the whole bright flame thing. I think the whole bright flame pretender. Varys potentially being a bright flame, etc. That kind of stuff. I do agree that was the original, the initial plan, um, because you know but we I think have you're definitely right. They didn't come about until Clash. We have Arian Bright Flame in the first Duncan Egg book, and then the Blackfire Rebellion is only mentioned in the second Duncan Duncan Egg novella because he hadn't come up with it. But it does. What it means is that I think in that first book it does come across as he wants Viserys on the throne. He wants a Targaryen on the throne for whatever reason. Um, and his his you know he sells Daenerys off to Khal Drogo. He wants them to you know take her to Vyas Dothrak with the intention of fulfilling his part of the bargain and invading Westeros. And then Varys is in Westeros to you know sow chaos to allow that to, to happen. Um, but obviously that fails. So his plan fails in the first book. And moving away from from the meta into the into the, the <laughs> into the books, like. What I'm, I still don't understand what his plan is, and I get the idea is his plan changes when the moon turns because it, that's kind of that represents Gurm, right? Like he's that, constantly changing his plans. To an opportunism that he has, and I think that's a very good trait in a schemer. Personally. Yeah, because I think that that's kind of like shades of Littlefinger there, and he's obviously done quite well for himself, at least in the books. He has the um, whole he has the whole Viserys plan, and then he has okay Aegon. Go and marry Daenerys. You know, okay, the Viserys plan failed. He's dead. Go and marry Viser- uh, Go and marry Danny. She has dragons. Uh, nephew and aunt marry. Come back with your dread. Blah blah blah. But then that fails, and they decide to invade Westeros without Daenerys. And then it's okay. He's going to jump on that and try and exploit that. And so, yes, like you said, he is an opportunist. He he plans things out, and then they go badly, and then he jumps onto the next thing. Um, but it always goes well for some reason. Like the thing is, I think that his plan to marry Aegon to Daenerys is objectively like the right call. That's mm-hmm. the way to do it. Yeah. Like Aegon's gonna obviously have massive problems when she gets to Westeros. And I think that I mean, even regardless, they turned around and go to Westeros and there's still a ton of success there. That's true. But that yeah. he's he's engineered kind of an all win situation for himself, at least in the short term. Yes, and of course we don't know enough about the long term to be able to judge that. And the fact that he is able to constantly jump between, uh, well, sort of, you know, chaos is a ladder, as I keep saying. He's able to uh, to grasp at new opportunities that present themselves. And in terms of the motivation, we don't fully know. Um, it could be that he just wants a Blackfire restoration. Maybe he wants a puppet king in power that will enrich him, that will increase trade with Pentos, perhaps. Maybe he wants to be on the council. Maybe it's purely self-fulfilling. Or, as some people theorise, perhaps he's a Blackfire supporter, and perhaps young Griff is actually his son with his wife, Sarah, who may be Sarah Blackfire, and his whole goal is put my son on the throne, fulfil my wife's wishes, and in doing so, also become powerful and wealthy. But there's that human, personal element there. Um... I'm personally partial to that interpretation, I, I, just in terms of how 
Durham Wright's characters. Yeah, it makes so much. It makes him such a more interesting character if instead of just a merchant who wants a puppet king to rule, it's like that that person is my son, and I'm doing this for my wife as well. Um, one thing I do have to ask you is I genuinely do not understand within the context of you know a young Griff being introduced into the story and Gurm's original plans changing. What is Illyrio planning in the first book? Like, what what was his goal? Was it... Okay, so Daenerys married Drogo, a Dothraki army. Okay, that makes sense. But then pushing for Viserys to take... Was his, was his plan to then say, haha, young Griff out of nowhere, follow young Griff instead? Or was it, like, to kill Viserys and then put young Griff in charge? Because why, so why using, not reveal Young Griff the earlier? Book in the context of the larger series, mm -hmm. you're asking. That's, yes, yeah, not meta, but within question. the within the narrative. How do we justify it? I, my thought is that the plan was to create as much of a boogeyman as possible in Viserys, because mm. the PR state of Targaryens not the best in Westeros after the Mad King. To have the Mad King's son return and also be mad and have this very scary army at his back would very much create kind of the ideal circumstance for Aegon to come in. And I think that he's probably, given his connections to the Golden Company, he's probably pretty confident that they could take down at least some of the Dothraki if aided by other people in Westeros, which he assumes he would be. Um, specifically, I don't think the horses would fare that well against elephants. Um, but, yeah, I think that overall his plan is to just... Kind of similarly to what he and Varys do in the other books, just to destabilize Westeros as much as possible so that this new leader can mm. emerge. So so a tyrant Targaryen comes over with a Dothraki savages, chaos ensues, then you have the true Targaryen heir who comes in with the, the Golden Company and they restore chaos and he is seen as a hero. Oh, I've just had a realization as well. Go on. It would kind of mirror at least how the Blackfires perceive themselves in their rebellions. It's a Targaryen mm. king wed to some uh, entity that's perceived as foreign, being either Dorne in the original Blackfire Rebellion's case or the Dothraki here, and essentially this other Targaryen claimant, a supposedly more true Targaryen claimant, probably carrying the sword Blackfire, is going to take the throne back. I mean, it's even it's even more. There's even more of a parallel because the original plan was for Viserys to marry Ariane Martell, to marry a Martell. Oh, the parallels yeah, you're are right. stronger. I forgot about that. Oh my god, the parallels yeah, are that's stronger. True. Yeah. So, oh, and you know, I might need to make a video about that. It, that's really good. It could be. Uh, I deserve fifty percent of all ad revenue from that. It could be that. Yep. Yeah, noted. Illyrio's plan. Because currently we don't know whether Young Griff is a Targaryen or a Blackfire, and if he is a Blackfire, whether that will ever be revealed or whether Illyrio and Varys realised, okay, we're going to do this, but there's no point revealing who he actually is because Blackfires don't have enough support. It's easier to pretend he's a Targ, right? But it could be that the original plan was, you know, Viserys, Dothraki, blah, blah, blah. They, they sow chaos, he's a tyrant. Then Aegon comes out, not pretending to be the son of Rhaegar, but openly saying, I am the last Blackfire. Openly as a Blackfire. Yeah, yeah I see that. to legitimise them more, because you would have the Mad King followed by his Mad Son, and then a Blackfire comes in to be like, I'm here to stabilise the realm. Uh, could legitimise the Blackfires more. True. Okay, that's that's a good There's interpretation. Uh, it is. Yeah. It is also very devious and very dramatic to be like, don't, it's, you know... We're not just going to sow chaos in the realm for an invasion. We can bring a doth a raping, raiding, murderous Dothraki army to invade. So then we can counteract that and like that's that's like a special form of kind of evil. That's like a giant false flag, yeah. basically, to restore order. Um, which is interesting because I think eight here for Lyria. Honestly. Yes. Hardly. I thought he would be lower just because of the, the way the plans are always changing and it, things... But they don't necessarily go bad for him. You know? They're, the plans fail, but, like, long-term, he didn't need to have the Dothraki invade. War of the Five Kings have already happened. Marrying Daenerys, it didn't work, but Young Griff is probably going to be successful anyway because King's Landing is becoming more chaotic. <laughs> yeah. I'll put him in... I'm good with A. I think it's pretty solid. I'll put him in A, okay. Somebody in chat said that's what Palpatine did, and I don't know what they're referring to. Um, I guess Palpatine... I guess with the Clone War? 
Yeah, sparking a war between the um, the separatists mm. and uh, the Republic in order to come in during the chaos and be like, we need an empire to stabilize things. Yeah. There we go. I wasn't expecting a Palpatine yeah. reference in this. And neither did I. That man, um, that man is S tier. So, if we're saving the hot D folks for later, we got Varus and Littlefinger left I, currently. I think it's good to move over to Varus just because it's very, it's sort of intrinsically linked it's with connected. Illyrio. Yeah. So I'll start with Book Varus. Show first. Show first. Oh, start with Book Varus. Sure. I think because no, we. Let's go Book. We were just talking about the yeah, because we talking Book Illyrio. Let's transition, right? Let's do a cheeky segue. So, um. I recent, by the way, I recently drew this Varus and Lirio like yesterday or two days ago, um, because I'm working on my Blackfire Rebellion video, my animated Blackfire Rebellion, and um, of course I need to talk about what's going on with Young Griff. So I need. Oh, well, he's legitimate. So. Of you course, but there are rumors, there are theories, and I gotta address them no, if only, gonna, if only to power. shut them down. He's the one true king. If only to shut them down. Um, Somehow the Black Fires return. Let <laughs> <laughs> be in the chat. That's how uh, wins that will begin. Um, Varys. Varys. So Varys basically has the same plan as Illyrio for reasons we don't fully understand. I do like the theory that he himself may be a Black Fire, but because he was castrated, he you know he can't continue the line. Um, the idea that he might be Illyrio's brother-in-law, even. You know, the brother of Sarah Blackfire. Mm. I don't know. Motivations aren't necessarily important. What he wants to do is... He wants to sow chaos in order to prepare for a uh, for the restoration and to get Aegon in power. But also, he has this whole shtick about doing what's best for the realm, which he says in the show, and in the show that is kind of his character. But I'm sure I read that... Mm. Uh, Varys's actor Conleth Hill uh, said that Gurm told him that yeah, ultimately Varys is a good person, and it's like that doesn't really make sense with what we've seen of Varys in the book. In the book, he does seem to be deliberately causing chaos for his own ends, for his own political ends. I think that I think that Gurm's comment to uh, Conleth Hill there could very much be talking about Varys' perception of himself, and I think we see that ah. in his speech at the end of Dance. He kind of <laughs> sees himself as advancing what's best for the realm, whether or not that's yeah. true or not is up to interpretation, but... Yeah, the, the way he's talking to Kevin before murdering him and being like, you know, I'm so sorry, yeah, you know, your force of stability and I respect chapter. that, but yeah, great ending. A great ending to the series, because we're not going <laughs> to... No, we will get wins. A great epilogue. I will not hear any naysaying, not today. Uh, so he does more. He does more than Illyrio does. So Illyrio, as another reason he's an A, actually, is that he 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 went from being a swaggering swaggering bravo, strolling the streets of Essos, to becoming a rich cheesemonger. Well, Varys is basically like a nobody, right? Like an orphan, or he ran away to join yeah. some mummers, and then he grew up influence as a spy master with a network. To the point where he was um, employed by Ares II, and he st- even after Ares fell, he stayed in power. He was employed by Robert, and he continued to serve as Master of Whispers. Uh, so, in terms of being a schemer, he went from nothing to serving yeah. two kings on opposing sides. That's pretty impressive. I have had a thought that it, what if the the vision of the modern dragon that Daenerys has. Does that imply that this whole Aegon scheme is more Varys than Illyrio, if he is the Mummer's dragon? Oh, That's I Varys, see, yes. Illyria. That's a good point. See, oh, okay, I interpret Mummer's dragon as just fake, is that he fake is the dragon. Mummer? No, that no. Is, that's interesting. There are the two different interpretations there. Yeah, no, no. I interpret it as Mummer's dragon meaning just fake dragon, right? The dragon of an actor, you know, a, a paper yeah. dragon. Not. I, I haven't really thought about it before, like... The Mama's Dragon, as in Varys' Dragon, his puppet. That prophecy was from Clash. That's but, probably before it was like a false dragon. But no, no, Clash was before the Blackfires. But what I said earlier was that Clash is probably where he came up with the bright, the bright flame idea. The Brit- yeah, bright the Brit- flame's still legitimate. Bright flames can make an actual claim. That's true, but I guess given it, the fact that Megor was overlooked, that's true. Maybe the plan was for it to be a full-blown pretender, you know, like there were in English history, where it's just a random person 
a piss water prince mm. falsely claiming to be Targaryen, not really descended from anyone, saying, hey, it's me. I don't know. But that's a good point. It could be either. But I, I always interpreted it, at least on my early reads, as Varys' dragon. Interesting. Because I do think his and Illyrio's plan are basically, you know, they will rule, they will rule, excuse me, they will rule Westeros through a puppet. Um, and stabilize the, the realm, I mean, the, and you know, in their own, in their own way. I don't, I don't get the puppet interpretation personally because I think that if that were the case, that would have factored into Varys's speech to Kevin in the epilogue. It sounds like they hmm. really do think that Aegon's like the right guy to rule. That's and a they good want point. Him to rule. Yeah, not only have they picked someone, and it can again, there could be a legitimate, there could be a like a personal humanistic reason in terms of he's Illyrio's son. But they went out of their way. They're like, yeah, we're gonna write, we're gonna raise this kid, Aegon, to spend time with common folk, to learn different languages and learn histories and learn philosophy, to train his mind, to mould him into being a perfect prince. Which of course, he can never be because that's not how human beings work, right? But yeah, yeah, it, you know, no, you're right. I, it, I think. It is about sure stay, they they still want to be in power in their own way, but having a new dynasty on the throne, having a king who is sort of perfect, who's been like socially engineered to be the perfect king, um, the king who bore the sword, if you will. Yeah. And in ter- so let's look at what Varus has achieved, right? So, like I said, he goes mm. from being an absolute nobody on the streets to building up a spy network in Essos to being invited to King's Landing and serving two different kings as the royal spymaster. During that time, he's basically plotting against both. So he's plotting against... Yep. Um, uh, he's plotting against Robert uh, with Illyrio and so on. And he's he's sort of playing everyone. So he does send an assassin after Daenerys because he, you know, he wants to um, maintain his legitimacy as... Uh, as the Master of Whispers. Um, he plays off against Tyrion and sort of helps Tyrion with defending the city, but also threatens him by visiting Shay and basically being like, yeah, you know, um, mm-hmm. this is what I can do. Don't cross me. Uh, he's he's a mummer and he's good at disguises. And so he he has various personas, including Rugen. So he, he disguises himself as a as a jailer. In the black cells, and that's how he's able to talk I to do Ned Stark. Him with most of Cersei's self-destruction and feast. Yes, yeah, I think yeah. Shall we? Shall we? Um, shall we skip to feast then? Because obviously, like I said, he's working as a spy master. He's manipulating things behind the scenes. Then, of course, he he's forced into abandoning his position because he's forced by Jaime into freeing Tyrion. Although, while freeing Tyrion, he probably deliberately is like, "Here's a chance to sow more chaos." Hey, Tyrion. I wonder where Tywin is sleeping right now, yeah. And then he realises, okay, I've lost my position in Master of Whispers, but let me use this opportunity. Chaos is a ladder, right? So let me exploit this. I'm now going... (laughs) He's literally, I am in your walls to Cersei. It is also, chaos is a ladder when he's pointing Tyrion up the ladder to kill his dad. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, if that wasn't the show, that could have been such a cool, like unsaid callback to oh, that line parallel, right? yeah um that is a good show only scene speaking of which one Chaos yeah, else is a ladder oh right I'll yeah i don't bit. yeah of course i thought you were talking about um Tyrion killing uh, tywin i was like that's not showing it oh yeah oh, yeah, yeah. Didn't no chaos and a ladder that's great that's a great show only moment yeah, kept, I, and a great speech I was still alive in the um but yeah uh he he becomes the bane of cersei's existence his whole plan is okay i'm no longer a master of whispers but what I can do is sow chaos from within the walls of King's Landing. I can have spies, I can sow seeds, I can stir up paranoia and hatred and have the Tyrells and Lannisters at each other's throats. Specifically, Cersei, right? So, what does Cersei find in the cells after Tyrion goes missing and Tywin is murdered? A coin. Coin of House Gardener, yeah. Yeah, which... It, you know, it's implied... Which is a masterful move from him. Yeah. Just to, like, leave a single coin and do all this. And what does, you know, what does that imply for Cersei? Did she thinks mm-hmm. the Tyrells must have paid off some guards to free Tyrion or, or something like that. Um, and it, that feeds into Cersei's already existing paranoia. Um, and, of course, at the end of the book, what else does he do? He 
he ha- he kills Kevin because Kevin is a force of stability uh, as a he regent. Pycelle. Yeah, and Pycel. So we'll go into Pycel in a second. But he kills Kevin because Kevin is the Lord Regent, right? And he's 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 bringing Tyrells and Reach Bannerman in the council, and he's trying to stabilize things and deal with the Faith Militant. And um, Raris doesn't want that, so he murders Pycel. But he doesn't just murder him. He shoots him with a crossbow bolt and then has a bunch of children stab him to death. And the last person to kill a Lannister with a crossbow bolt was Tyrion. And the sort of person who would be the size of a child and would, you know, have knife wounds at a certain level would be a dwarf like Tyrion. So he wants Cersei Mm -hmm. to believe that Tyrion is still hiding in King's Landing and murdered Kevin and is going after her next. And do you want to talk more about Pycelle? Do you know why Pycelle's death is particularly important? So my thought on Pycelle's death is just that he's been such like a kind of stabilizing, not even stabilizing force. He's just been such a constant force for the past like five kings that his removal seems massive in addition to the fact that, what, there's not really going to be any source of great uh, advice or communications to the Lannisters at that point? No, Pice- I don't know. Let's see. Pycelle is a what massive... Well, for one, he's a like you were saying, he's like a massive Lannister Tony, right? He's a he is the Lannister puppet. Now he's gone. Cersei has lost an ally, an ally right? But not just that. He was, that's the thing, though. Like Go he on. wasn't even Cersei's ally in Feast. He was no, the only person on the council actually giving her good advice. Yeah, and no, she never listened. Yeah, and she was treating him like shit. And so, some people theorize that he basically abandoned being her ally. That when she asks about uh, Marjorie buying moon tea, if you believe the the great the Grand Tyrell conspiracy, he's now working with the Tyrells and he lied to her. Blah blah blah. That's a whole other thing. But his death means more than just destabilization. It means that the the way is paved for a new Grand Maester. And initially, when Tyrion tore down Maester Pycelle and stripped him of his office, the Citadel were planning. To, um, the Conclave of Maesters were planning to install. Maester, uh, Archma- no, not Archmaester, Maester Gorman as the new Grand Maester. Gorman being Gorman Tyrell, Gorman the uncle, Aww. not Gorman Peak, but Gorman Tyrell, the uncle of excited. Mace Tyrell. And of course, Tywin didn't want this to happen, so he quickly reinstated Pycelle, which is why Pycelle becomes a Maester again. Mm. So with with Kevin dead, with Mace as Hand of the King and Bannerman like Paxter Redwine and um, Randall Tarly on the small council, what's going to happen is new Grand Maester, and it's going to be a Tyrell, and Cersei will become even more paranoid, right? She'll become even more furious. You're going to have Mace as the Hand, Paxter as Master of Ships, Randall as Master of Laws, a Tyrell um, Grand Maester, uh, maybe yeah. Garth the Gross coming in to be Master of Coin after um, uh, what's his name? Harris Swift inevitably dies in Bravos because he's wearing garish colours and the Bravosi hate garish colours and has <laughs> pick jewels with such people. I'm sure he'll be fine. That would be a great scene. That that's one of my favorite theories. That he's just going to be slaughtered by Bravosi because he's like, yeah, he's walking around in his garish like blue and yellow colors with a courtesan on his side, and they're going to be like, I challenge you, sir, and just like completely butcher him. But yeah, that will completely fuck up the stability in King's Landing, and who knows what Cersei will do uh, to further destroy the Lannister it's legacy, grand basically. Mister. Alden Halfmaester comes along. Yes. Oh, that honestly, that would be a good video idea too. Like, um, young... Grand Maester Halden. No, no, Young Griff's small council. What will Ooh, he... what call. will his small yeah. council look like? Right. Well, Connington is the hand. Connington is the hand. Rowley Duckfield as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Mm-hmm, as he should be. Um... Grand Maester Halden. Um. Yeah. Master of Coin, Illyrio. Illir- I'm keeping Mace on as Master of Coin. Or okay. Something. I'm kind of in my head. I always have like Illyrio as Master of Coin, and then Varys as Master of Whispers. Still. Yeah, that could be. But cool. also see Duran having a role. Mm, Master or, uh, of Laws. Like, one of the Sand Snakes is coming to be on the Council. I could see that as well, especially if he marries Arion. Yes, that could be cool. Because aren't a couple of them are going to the King's Landing right now? I forget which two. Um, Tyene is going. To infiltrate the faith and find out what's going on with um, the faith militant, and, and Ni- another Nime- is going to like be on the council. Nymeria oh. is going to be on the council. Yeah, that's it. Um, Grand Septa Lamore. <laughs> the High Septa. <laughs> yeah. Well, we know Ashari High... has other business to attend to, of course. But High Septa Lamore is actually a great idea. Can you imagine? 
That'd be pretty good. Better than the High Sparrow. Hell yeah. All so right. what are we thinking tier-wise for Varus? Uh, it's A or S for me. Um, so far, honestly, I, I want to say S. Just because... I'm leaning S. I was surprised to be leaning S, but I think I am. Just because we know of more specific schemes he is engaged in than Illyrio. Illyrio is more kind of a general yeah. thing with Varus. Oh, we know every little thing he's doing, and it's... And, and so he's far, more, I think, he's directly winning. involved in, like, the greater machinations of this scheme. I think Illyrio is kind of more, kind of, uh, he's up like, at a 50,000 foot view. He's like, Varus is kind yeah. of boots on the ground. Illyrio is like the financier. Exactly. Illyrio oh, runs the super pack, but Varus is the campaign manager. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd say, I'd say pretty easy S for Varus. Okay, now we got to go on to a different Varus altogether. The king himself. D e, e or E. The Merman King. The Merlin King. The thing that the kill show Varus for me is his supposed motivation of being, like, for the realm, for the best, for, like, the people or whatever. It He constantly, like, flip-flops for no reason. And he flip flops against Daenerys so early in season eight, and for no reason whatsoever, when she's done literally nothing, he's... that it essentially drives him both to his own death before she's done anything wrong, and her to madness. He is a he I is. I think it's it. He is the ultimate flip flopper. Like you're right. He, uh, and he's none of it like correctly. Like he never flip flops right. He's, he like so so what he served the Mad King and then he served Robert, but then he was secretly serving Daenerys, but then. He's like, she's like, do not betray me. Always let me know if you disagree with me. He's like, yes, of course. And he's immediately like, okay, we need John on the throne. And he's like, what? <laughs> and then also he just sits in Marine for like all of season six doing nothing except talking oh. to Kinvara. Um, yeah, you can't like, blame him though. She's season a... season six than Tyrion. At least Tyrion's trying to do things. Yes. They're stupid things, but it's S something. S season five. Okay, so season five, he's like, okay, Tyrion. Welcome to Marine. You're working with Daenerys now. Bye. And then he vanishes, right? He just disappears. Season six, yeah. he's in Marine at the start. He does, yeah, like a couple of schemey things, but then he, to find out who the son of the harpy is, but then he disappears again. And then he reappears to bring Dawn on Daenerys' side, which is something, you know, he does some negotiation there. Um, could have been a raven. <laughs> it could have been. And then he somehow teleports all the way back to Daenerys' ship. To say oh yeah, because he's on the ship at the end of the season. Even I though he was in Dawn. That. Yeah. In the same episode. Instead of just like meeting her on Dragonstone from Dawn. But you know, that's how I it don't is. see why they cut out Kevin and Pycelle's death. Like that could have he vanished, he was gone for all of season five. That could have been a great like ending great stinger ending. to season five. Uh, one thing we didn't mention yeah. actually is the nature of Pycelle's death. So Ke like we said, Kevin Lannister, he dies in a way that frames Tyrion. But Pycelle, it's implied that he has, like, a gash on his head with bits of his skull on the table, which implies he was, like, mm -hmm. smacked in the back of the head. That feels really personal to me. That I kind of feel like... Yeah, I think you're right. You know you know what that was? What? The first thing that we hear about Varys in, like, the histories in terms of his dealing with Aerys II is that him and Pycelle are on opposite sides of opening the city. Yes. Varys is urging against uh, letting him open it to Tywin, and Pycelle is for. I think that's... Yeah, that old grudge to simmer I, I kind of see it as that, and so when he decides to assassinate him, he's like, you know, I'm gonna do this myself. Like, picks up a candlestick, yeah, just I'm gonna do it. Him. I'm and gonna pull a daemon and just him, smash with a rock. Him arguing against the gates being opened, I don't quite understand why he did that. Beyond, like, that, be, that is that mentioned in the first book, right? Because I understand it if the idea is that he's like, I, a, I think it is. If I'm he's a Targaryen, yes, it is. It is. So if he's a Targaryen loyalist, it makes sense for him to be like, he genuinely supported the Targs and he wants Daenerys and Viserys back because, you know, whatever. But I don't know why someone who would want... I don't I don't quite understand why he would argue for that. I could honestly kind of see it. I think that, like, as a character, it makes sense for him to, like, empathize and want to protect the people in this city. Because what we know of him, he's grown up very poor and in cities. So I could see him wanting to, like, instill chaos in the realm through, like, starting wars that might be far removed from him and he's never really seen. But when it comes to, like, actively attacking both a city where he's lived for a long time and a city where a lot of, like, 
horror people who remind him of his previous self live, I could see that as something he'd want to avoid. Yeah. So, I don't know. sorry, we we got sidetracked talking about the interesting Varus. Let's go back to the show Varus. Yeah, true. Uh, E-tier. E-tier. E-tier for show Varus. Yeah, he, he constantly flip-flops, he keeps messing up, and then he gets killed at the end, and it's just kind of like, why? Honestly, I'm almost tempted to not put him in E. Genuinely. Because I think... Where, an, I think where an, do you want to put him? I want to put him in D, because I think he's similar to Tyrion, where he's really good I in the he's first... worse than Tyrion. Well, but but that's because Tyrion's on screen doing stuff. Varys isn't is he? Do, season five and six. It's not like he does anything dumb. He just doesn't do anything. He's just not on screen. It's only really season eight where he's actively being stupid. But the issue for me is the fact that Aegon was removed means that any quote unquote scheming that he did in the early four seasons behind the scenes amounted to literally nothing. Like, the only action he takes in the first few seasons that does much of anything is removing Tyrion, and uh, that's about it. I think it's... The reason I'm pushing for D is that there's another character that I think belongs in E, and I don't think this cari- character I, I is on... I think I know the character you're he, referring to, I, and I think Varys is worse than him. Oh, okay. I think we might disagree on that, So, but I will, I will put him down to E, because I'm not... Okay, f- I'm, I'm open to debating this once we get there. Sure. We'll put him there for now. So, before we move on to our next character, I am going to pop to the toilet. Feel free to entertain the chat. Sounds good. And, yeah. Okay, I will talk to you to the chat. I will babysit for Are you having fun, chat? Are you enjoying it? I hope you are. And also... Yes, hello. Remember, send in super chats if you want to ask us some questions. And to support the channel. Because yeah. it really helps out. Um, yeah. 150 viewers, that's not too bad. You got that Quinn name recognition. Okay, I will be back. Uh, I don't think that's it. I think it's a good time. It is a holiday, which I didn't forget about. People mentioned it in the chat. Indigenous People's Day, which is great. Hello, chat. How are you? It's me, the GM Quinn. How how are things? Hi, Jace the Ace. Uh, yeah, no, this is this is going pretty well. I I do firmly agree that Varys, I think, is probably worse than anybody else on this list. At least in the show, he's just I don't know. Removing Aegon completely removes any semblance of coherent motivation or thought he might have had in earlier seasons and it just makes me angry i think i talked about that in my removal of Aegon video but uh i don't know that might have been the accidental uh section where i was speaking in tongues um let's see we should add Cat- catelyn could be an interesting choice for uh folks uh for a schemer i don't know how much of a schemer she is though especially like being in her head so much I don't know. She's definitely like an advisor, but I don't know if I'd say she's a, a schemer straight up. Uh, since Dave is gone, I'm sorry for calling you British, Quinn. Uh, when's more videos about Tom and banning beats? I need more info about that. I will. I'm sure there'll be a follow up to that in the near future. I'm so glad I made that video and that people liked it. Uh, that was originally supposed to be an April Fool's video, but I got impatient and didn't want to wait six months, so I just kind of made it. Uh, but you know, that was that was a ton of fun to make. Um, and it actually, it ended up more coherent than I expected in terms of like my analysis of it, at least historically. Um, I saw someone say it add Unwin Peak. We do have a bigger list of a bunch more schemers. This is just the amount we thought we'd be able to get through today. We will have Unwin, we'll have Olena, we'll have many, many other people, uh, coming up in other, uh, live streams as well. I think we'll probably do a series of this. Sir Pounce is in the Mace the Ace tier that is off the chart above S, so that should be good. Yeah, no, this uh, this has been fun, especially when she she tries to. That's a good point, but I don't know if that was a scheme necessarily. That I judge that as more of kind of like a gut reaction that she tried to do. She just wanted to like just hit tearing. She tried to kill Bran allegedly. Tywin and Cersei will also be on a future one. I'm uh, I'm excited for that. Cersei, best schemer in the series, bar none, easily. Book Cersei specifically, uh, in addition to being the best uh, character and point of view in the books. I don't know what I ranked Cersei in my point of view character ranking. I might have put her at three. I think she's moved up to two since I reread Feast. Which, sorry, Jamie, but, uh, you know, she still doesn't beat John Con, because John Con's the best. Yeah. I really like the Dark Sister bit. Any more House of the Dragon lore? I do plan on doing more House of the Dragon videos. I'll probably just do that closer to 
when House of the Dragon comes out, because I think we're kind of in a, a bit of a lull at the moment, but uh, you can definitely expect more House of the Dragon content whenever that gets closer to release. I'll probably do, like, I don't know, I've never analyzed a trailer or anything before, because I, uh, I started doing House of the Dragon, the Song of Ice and Fire content, partway through the first season, I think around episode three, so I was kind of jumping in into the, the middle of things. Where's Gurm on this list? I think his schemes are... Seeing as they're so manifold and yet unfinished, I think it's tough to tough to do it. Tough to rank him. I've uh, returned. John Quan as a schemer would be interesting to rank. We should do that. We should. Are you back? I am back. We should yes. add John Con. John Con, yes. In fact, I've got that big list on Discord, haven't I? John Con should be there. Yeah. There are a few others too that my uh, patrons brought up in the patron Discord. Um, what else did they say yeah, that wasn't right. on my list? Um, Honestly, before we jump back into it, I'm happy to uh, mm-hmm. like go through what the entire list is and let people know. Because if this if this is gonna, oh yeah, good call. If this is going to turn into a live stream series, it'll be good to kind of tease what will come ahead. Um, sure. So let me just. And I've got a few that I want to add on to the list as well. Yeah, I somehow I completely forgot to mention Alicent Hightower, even though I have Otto, which is very strange. I don't know how oh, how yeah. I missed that out, and I'm also I also missed um I also missed Cersei. Yeah, that's what I was, Cersei's the big omission for me. She's S tier. I don't know we'll why I didn't put day, Cersei sure. in because that's the best one. There we go, Alison. And also, okay, and there are a couple of others. Are there any schemers on Rhaenyra's side? I'm trying to think. Uh, Mizaria. What do you call Corlin? No, of course. Mizaria. Yeah. Mizaria. Yeah. I, uh, other than Mizaria, that I, yeah, I wouldn't really call anyone else schemers. Okay, where's... What about Thailand? Should we have Thailand on the list? Um, we don't. I'll add Thailand. That would be a bit of a spoiler section thing, wouldn't it? That is true. Okay, let me go through the list then. I've edited it a bit. Okay, so the schemas that we will talk about in the future, uh, the historical ones, there's Tyana of the Tower, who was the sort of unofficial mistress of whispers for King Magor the Cruel, as well as being one of his... Uh, and later his queen. His queen, yeah. There's Otto Hightower, who we'll be talking about today. There's his daughter, Alicent Hightower, of course. Um, there's Lara Strong, also known as Larry Clubfoot. Um, and there's Mazaria, who is quite different in the books compared to the show. That'll be an interesting one to talk about, actually. That will. Uh, there's Unwin Peak, who um, would be in a spoiler Ooh. section because that character has not appeared, but will probably appear at some point in House of the Dragon, if not next season, then the season after. Um, Blood Raven, of course, is the king of schemers. He's the one and only. Technically, he's not in the show. I'm not going to count that. I'm not going to count. Bitter Steel could also be on there. A schemer? He doesn't give me. He's, I guess. I mean, he's always scheming rebellions. I don't think he's as good at it as Blood Raven, but he does it. Yeah, you know what? I'll add him to the list. Why not? Uh, whatever. We do have several good suggestions from chat as well that I know aren't on the list. Okay. Um, okay, uh, pile up the suggestions in your head while I go through this list, and then I'll add them at the end. So there's that now. another one. There's Ellen Rain, who check out my um, Reigns of Castamere video on my channel, uh, where I talk about Ellen Rain, who... You know, married three, uh, sorry, married two Lannisters and tried to marry a third in order to become Lady of Castle Rock. And then the new man she married, he man- she managed to persuade him to join a rebellion against the Lannisters. So she was always, she was always on the grind. Um, she's an interesting historical figure. And then Tywin Lannister, as you said, from House of the Dragon, uh, he's the master of ships in the sh- season one of the show. Um, he'll have more more of a role to play as the show goes on, and he does some very interesting stuff in the books. Um, a Song of Ice and Fire characters. Uh, we'll be talking about Littlefinger. We've talked about Varys, Illyrio, Pycelle I've got on there. He's He counts as somewhat of a schemer. And the show version of Pycelle as well, if we talk about that deleted scene, that could be quite interesting. As um, we should. Wyman Manderley. One of the best. <laughs> one of the greatest schemers. Um... Uh, Tywin, of course, and then there's book versus show. Tyrion, book versus show. Cersei, book versus show. Olena, book versus show. Um, one of the classic schemers, Olena. Duran Martell, 
I guess I guess you could bring up the book version, uh, the show version, just for fun, but that's mostly a book thing. Um, Ariane Martel from the book, and then a couple of Marine characters, Shave Pate and I. I wrote Mo Resnack, but I don't know if that's it's right. Resnack, Mo Resnack. Oh right. Somehow the word Resnack. Somehow I remembered the word Resnack. It, it is. It's so nice you say it twice. Exactly. Um, then. Orain Waters question mark. One of my patrons said that Orain Waters could be considered a schema, maybe, in terms of the fact that he basically builds himself a fleet of criminals and then flees with and gets away with it. <laughs> um Who has it? I don't know if we're stretching the term, um, but I know. Uh and then I've got four Yeah. Yeah, the, the, I've finished four that my I've seen and that we haven't Go yeah. on, go on. I'll add them to the onto the Discord list. Walder Frey, which I think is a good oh, one. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, the Sea Snake, which I think close enough to... A, I, I, he's always, like, grasping power, and I think that you could make an argument. Especially mm, yeah, I'll add him. I'll, 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 I'll definitely add him. Euron Greyjoy. A schemer? Yeah. I mean, he has just in chat. he has schemes, but I feel like a schema is very specific. It's not just someone who has a That's plan. That's right. Well, if not you're on Victorian Greyjoy, I think. Oh, that. what? As a schema? What's he scheming? He's scheming. That's what he's doing right now. He, uh, to, to be fair, he is he's scheming, scheming to, to marry Daenerys to betray Euron. Yeah. I don't. I think we're I think stretching the term here. Best. We're 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 writing down characters so. characters who have a plan. And my last suggestion which is, is every to be character. and sell me. What's his scheme? I think Barristan should be listed as well. What's he scheming? The oh, show's Sansa. Sansa's a good idea. Sansa, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I also, yeah, also in the book as well, um, just in terms of, like, specifically Vale stuff, but also in the show, yeah. So, th yeah, this is... I'm putting everyone on this, this list, so we could change our mind at a different point. Um, other ones I'll add, Roose Bolton. I think that does count. Yeah. And there we go. Oh, Lothar Frey as well. Mm -hmm. Every Frey explained. Coming soon. Coming in 2024. Maybe. Potentially. Maybe. I believe in you. Let's see. Do my patrons have any more? Oh, Gorman Peak. Damon could be a good idea. Is Damon a schemer? Uh, he's, he doesn't give me schemer vibes. He's not a schemer, no. He's not. I don't know. I again. He's got his. He's got his scheming cloak. I think he does. He does have a schemy cloak. I don't know. I won't. I. If, I'll probably like remove half of these anyway. But because I kind of want to keep it to like the sort of the classic schemer, as opposed to just people. Who... I'm going to step away from a moment, and then when we get back, we can discuss Littlefinger. I assume. Yes. We will right. jump into the LF himself. Um. Okay. I will. Check out how Chad's doing, but before that, I was going to add one more person. Who was it? Oh, yes, Gorman Peak um, from the books, who was scheming, um, uh, preparing the uh, the second Blackfire, uh, second Blackfire invasion with Damon the Second. That whole conspiracy uh, technically counts. How's the chat doing? Hello, hello. Oh, I missed a super chat. Oh, it was a super chat aimed towards Quinn, wasn't? It? <laughs> yeah, you're you're right, Boombler. We need more uh, videos about Tom and banning beats. We need to know what sort of famine that would cause in Westeros. Oh, Quaith, maybe Quaith, or maybe the Green Grace as well. High Sparrow. Oh, I'm not sure. One Weg, <laughs> one da one. He schemed himself to be the last of the giants, to be fair. I think the word scheme now doesn't sound like a word. It feels like we've just... We've I've said it so much, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, okay, while I'm waiting for Quinn, actually... I don't know how long this stream will go on for, but if we exhaust these three... I think we should add uh, someone else. So... Who else can we add to this pile? Alison. I think Alison does deserve to be there. I 
can't believe I've... How did I forget Alison? Um, do I have a recent Alison? I'm not sure. Let's have a look. Eh. Okay, that, that looks like an old art piece, actually. That doesn't look super modern, but I'll include this one, so... You can tell which ones are my older ones because they have larger eyes. I decided to make the eyes bigger with my my last few months, couple of months of videos. Okay, so while well, we're waiting for Quinn, if you want to send any questions in the chat, who's back? Oh, he's already here, and I've no added questions. I will not allow it. Damn it! I've added Alison just in case we we exhaust all these people. When are we ending again? Oh, sounds good. When have you got to flee? Uh, I think a little before one or around there. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, do have a midterm on Wednesday that I need to study for. All right, so about uh, half an hour. Okay. Civil procedure. Oh, my God. So, let's move on yeah. to... Should we good? Let's move on to Littlefinger, shall we? Yes. Are we starting with book or show? I would like to start with... I don't know. I was going to say book, but also a main point I want to make about book is a comparison to the show. Shall we start with show, then? Okay, show with Littlefinger. Let's start on with the show. So, Shanja. Chaos is a ladder. Show Littlefinger is not as bad as Show Barris. I. I don't. He has. He at least has some motivation, which Varys does not. Varys has motivation. They both have motivation. It's just. But like. The Varys just keeps changing his mind. Like more specific. Varys keeps changing his mind. Varys is incompetent, but so is Littlefinger. In fact, wait, no motivation. I say what? What? Classic. Yeah, sure. He has a vague motivation by the la by season seven, but he's not doing anything. He he still generally has an idea of I want to be king, but he does nothing to exploit that. But I would also he argue he does more in the first few seasons, like. The War of the Five Kings is kind of his scheme. Yes, his his scheme. As a schemer, he is better than Varys in the first four seasons. But I, I also think he's worse than Varys in the later season, like in in seven specifically. He's worse than Varys is. Varys disappears, comes back, and then like switches sides and is a bit dumb. Littlefinger becomes useless. He becomes utterly useless and just stupid. And he doesn't seem to, he just sort of, but, he goes out with a whimper. He just hangs about doing nothing. Hear me out. Go on. He is stupid in season seven, absolutely. But everyone in Winterfell is more stupid than he is. And the only reason he loses is because there's an uh, omniscience <laughs> sitting in Winterfell. That's a good point, if actually. If not for that, he would not have lost because everyone else was dumber than he was. That's a good point. already dumb. It's not even a story of, like, The Apprentice... It takes, like, God to take him down. It's not even a story of The Apprentice outwitting the Master. It's The Apprentice turned, no, it's turned the story to God. it's a computer outwitting the Master. <laughs> yeah. It's a story of an AI beating a chess champion. Maybe the Game of Thrones is just a warning about the dangers of AI. Shanja, please. I'm a bit confused. I, I do. I think, he's, I think he's D tier. I think... Being better in the first few seasons combined with needing Bran to take him down in season seven, yeah. which isn't great, but it's still better than Varys, like sending a letter and getting caught. <laughs> well, no, no, wait, no, Varys doesn't get caught sending a letter. He burns the letter before he's caught. No, Tyrion tattles on him. That's, oh, yeah, that's, that's how it. Varys dies. That's true. Okay, so... I, I, I think Littlefinger is, is okay, worse than Varys. So, so, oh, sorry, better than Varys. So that we're not repeating ourselves with book Littlefinger, is there anything he does in those first seasons that's different from show version, right? There's nothing, is there? He basically, he does the same stuff. Um, no, the, the, like, kind of impetus of the scheme to marry Sansa to not the Tyrells is different, because it's a different Tyrell, but other right, than that, yeah. pretty much the same. And I will, I will say, even in those early seasons, he's a bit dumber. Two reasons. Yeah, that's my one. Main, I'll, I'll get to that with Book Littlefinger. I think Book Littlefinger is undebatably better than even early show Littlefinger. Because I will say, it, uh, early show Littlefinger, one, there's that scene where he's randomly, like, being cocky and bragging to Cersei about like, about the yeah. fact he knows about the incest, and she, her response that's is, not in the book. I can literally kill you at any point. And it's like, Littlefinger, why would you even yeah. do that? You're on that, what? You, 
And then the other thing is when he sees Arya at Harrenhal, and it's played off as if he recognizes her, and then his salute, and then he just like does nothing with that information. He literally sees a we Stark girl, a... and and the actor said yeah. he played it as if he recognized her, but then he's just like, okay, bye. Would you do have a super chat for a minute or so? Ago? Oh right, I didn't want to lose. From uh, Elliot Boyd Stringer was. Uh, thank you, you for go? the super. I know, uh, you read it out. I've been reading out all of them. You have a go. Sure. Uh, I think it's a suggestion of a schemer that is Lord Danis Darkling schemes Darkling of D- Duskengate Dale, the Darkling. Sorry, like dark <laughs> twenty times. A uh, Darkling schemer for whom all Darkling schemes are named. Dennis Darkling. That could be a good one. That could be. That's a good addition to the list. And speaking of Darkling schemes, I can't forget. I can't believe I forgot to add Iron Rod himself. The Darkling schemes true. man himself. He's in on that scheme. True. Hold on, let's see if I can read the super chat without tripping. Lord Dennis Darkling schemes Darkling of Duskendale, the Darkling schemer for whom all Darkling schemes are named. Yes! Oh, I had the advantage because you went well first. Done. Thank you. Okay. Um, that is true. So he's, apart from being a bit dumber than the book version, he does the same thing up until the veil, where instead of doing that Harry the Air plot, he then... Sells San. Oh yeah, hold on. Season five, he sells Sansa off to the Boltons, which is stupid. His whole plan appears to be let the Boltons and Stannis fight each other out so they're weak, and then when they're weak, the Vale comes in to rescue Sansa, and then he secures the Vale and the North that way. But he also doesn't know that Ramsay is villainous and something. And then for some reason, despite helping Jon Snow and the North win, everyone like hates him for no reason, even though they have no reason to. It's like they're, they're acting like TV viewers who know what he's done when they haven't. Mm-hmm. And then season six, yeah, season six, he just waits to attack and then he does. And then season seven, he mopes around Winterfell, basically being irrelevant and then going, okay, my next step of my grand plan to take the Iron Throne is to make a couple of girls hate each other. <laughs> and so he just tries to stir Valid. up beef between Sansa and Arya, which, again, you're right, it does succeed. But it's such a weak, pathetic plan that's just so oh, yeah, inconsequential. No, it's, it's stupid and shouldn't work. He, it does. he went from being Lord Protector of the Vale, and in the show he's also Lord Paramount of the Trident, and he has the key to the North in Sansa. To spending season seven like just trying to stir up beef between Sansa and Arya, and it's like, are there more interesting things you could be doing as a schemer instead of just like I don't know. I think I don't know whether he's. Th- dumber and than Varys or whether I'm just whether I prefer Littlefinger as a character and so I'm more pissed off I definitely prefer Littlefinger as a character but I, I think he's a solid D tier I think he's a tier above Varys in the show uh, I want to know I, I want to know what the chat thinks because I would swap Varys and Littlefinger D and E chat what do you, maybe we do a poll do you think Varys or Littlefinger that's cool worse in let, late seasons of that's a great Wars? idea let the chat decide we're split let the chat decide so yeah. um, I'll start with um, yeah, actually, no, instead of, and, I'll uh, just Mike do one say, poll, before right? Before you vote, remember, remember the late Lord Haven's opinion about the Muppet Tullys and allow that to color your view here. Okay, so we're smearing me based on past comments, huh? Correct. Damn. Who's the better schemer? Uh, show Varys. Show Little So we're finger. voting for who's better. Who's better, and then that will determine who's D tier and who's E tier, basically. As opposed yeah. to doing... Do We've got some people saying both E. No, one is worse than the other, and we need to find out which. I wouldn't be mad with both E, but also... Let the chat decide. Let mad. the chat decide. Littlefinger is absolutely worse. Dumb Harris as fuck. 20 times worse. He was super dumb, but... So is everyone around him. Harren Hall. I suppose that's off the table as well. I don't like being made a fool of dwarf. That's I'm, pretty good. I'm just entertaining the masses while we you wait should, for that. You gotta that. do more impressions, man. I, sh- I should do. Those are my only two impressions I can do. <laughs> Show Littlefinger and Kermit about to sneeze. And Kermit? That's all you need, really. You got the full gamut there. Exactly. That's how you get the ladies at the club. You're like, do you want to hear my Kermit impression? Or my Littlefinger impression? <laughs> or do you want to hear Kermit as Littlefinger? Yeah, Heron Hall. I uh, suppose that's off the table as well. 
Flippy says this is how democracy fails. It is how democracy succeeds as Littlefinger is winning with two-thirds of the vote. That's absurd. That's absurd. You poisoned their minds by bringing up the Muppet right. Tully thing. No, I that think that was just, a dirty I politics and you know the it. Correct opinion. It's also true that Varys had another season to self-destruct and be worse. Littlefinger kind of got mercy killed. Like, if he were around in season 8, I'm sure he'd be worse. Ah, Sansa, don't cut my throat. I love you. <laughs> now I'm just picturing Sansa as Miss Piggy. <laughs> I can't do that impression. I don't think I can either. I'll do a reverse one. I'll do I'll do a reverse Kermit Littlefinger one. It's not easy being green, Sansa. Trust me. You've got a gift. Forget the whole A Song of Ice and Fire thing. Just start doing Voice Kermit acting, videos huh? on YouTube. Oh yeah, that'll get views. Kermit, Kermit impressions. Yeah, Kermit's be got a massive audience. Raking in the millions there. Eh? I'll definitely include some of that, some of those impressions and stuff in my uh, hot D reviews when we start getting Muppet Tullies. As you should. Once uh, the the Muppet Tullies come out. I, I heard the is last. Kermit... Go ahead. Which is Kermit? Kermit's one of the younger ones, if I recall. He's like the youngest. Yeah. I th- the age order. I thought you meant like in terms of Lord like, Grover is the old guy. I thought you meant Muppet Law for a second, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> no, no, I'm in I'm in hot D territory. Um, Kermit and Oscar are the grandchildren. No, they're the great grandchildren. They're the That's young ones. Thought. Yeah, and Elmo is their father, and then Elmo's grandfather is Grover, and then we don't know the name of the one in between. I thought it was, I thought Elmo and Oscar were reversed. I thought that Oscar was the. The new Lord of River Run. Oh, maybe. You might be right. You might be right. I think. I think it's. Let me. Let me Google. It. Wait, no, no. I think Oscar is is the, is one of the lads. No, I think it's. I think Elmo is the Lord. Let's see. I'm pulling up the family tree. Uh, yeah, you're right. Elmo is the. Booyah. Elmo. It's Grover, and then a generation, and then Elmo, and then Elmo's sons are Kermit and Oscar. They're in the lads. Which might be my favorite, like, name of a group in all of Gurm's work. Yeah, the, the lads. The lads, I do like. Uh, again, I could rant for a while about how stupid the ages are. If, if they were, like... True. A, a bunch of, like, teenagers that were called the lads. Teenage, the 12. teenage warriors called the lads, that's cool. Uh, three, like, 12, 11-year-olds commanding armies, and f- that's absurd, and I... Duh. I hope the show will make them teenagers. Like you just know it. I'm sure they will. I don't know though. Ryan Condell, he does like the, uh, he likes the purity. Maybe he'll keep it as is. But he changed some ages from the book, right? I think he did. Yes. Oh he yeah. No. Oh yeah. You're, you're right. <laughs> he actually made major changes. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Okay. Who's okay? Let me let me end this damn poll. Four minutes ago, this sixty-two poll, I votes. Think is about ended. That being said. Yeah. That being said, there's over 100 people watching. Only 60 people have voted. Uh-huh. In theory, the votes could you're change. Not gonna, you're not gonna take Everyone get in here. the poll and vote for Varys. Nope, vote for Littlefinger. I refuse. You know what? But ben Blackwood was 11? Jesus. Yeah, it's, re- it's, it's, it's really dumb. I have not read Fire and Blood in a minute. The Great Warrior, the Great Commander, ben- Benjakot Blackwood, the 11-year-old. Bloody Ben. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. All right. I concede, okay? Yeah, we should probably finish. Let's discuss, I think, finish discussing TV Littlefinger and then book Littlefinger and then probably call it. All right. So, looks like, TV yeah. Littlefinger, D tier. Littlefinger yeah. is officially in D tier um, because we don't care about logic on this live stream. There we go. Down you go, you scumbag. Logic to the ladder. Shall we go on to... Pokemon, go to the poll. <laughs> Shall we move on to the good little thing? That would be a good live stream idea. What? Which Pokemon are a Song of Ice and Fire characters? That would be a great idea if I knew anything about Pokemon. I know everything. Maybe that'll be a solo live stream for me then. I mean, I don't, I don't sound like a prick, but like as a kid, I watched some Digimon. Mm. Oh wow! <laughs> I watched I was never a Digimon. I person. watched I was... like the ripoff. <laughs> I didn't realize it was like a cheap knockoff. I was like, yo, this is cool. This is edgy. Fuck Pokemon. That's for little babies. I watch Digimon. Digimon. Digital monsters. Okay, let's move on, shall we? Book oh, Littlefinger. Uh, Book Littlefinger, I think, is, He's is far stronger than than Cho Littlefinger, mostly because 
he comes off so much better. He's just like friendly to everyone, and he's just kind of a chill guy that nobody really thinks anything of. Yeah, I at think least for the first couple books, far more engaging than show Littlefinger, who is played as a smarmy, unlikable git that no one would possibly be friends with or trust. Mm-hmm. Unlike in the book, where yeah. He is a man of low birth. Newborn. He is everyone's friend, but nobody's best friend. Everyone likes him. He's useful to everyone. Um, he's just Littlefinger. You know, he's got no ambition he could because he's. On the subreddit. He might have been Renly's best friend. He may have been. He may... and Renly have a nice little friendship in the first book. Yeah, possibly. And, you know, he people are like, why would he have any ambition? You know, he's a master of coin despite owning a tiny tower in the veil he's great he should be grateful right he has no ambition above that even jamie in a feat in feast thinks for himself you know what little thing would make a good hand um which leads into another theory i have which is you know the original plan for the manuscript was that jamie would would be a villain oh maybe little and would be jamie's hand yeah that was that that's oh. that's my theory i don't think anyone's actually said this so this might be like a new theory i'm I bringing like to that. the fandom I'm planning on doing an animated video Kid about about the manuscript version and like how I try and expand that and how that could have been a proper trilogy. But I'm I wonder if that line is meant to be like Gurm having a little like like a self referential joke. Like, that ties <laughs> in perfectly. Yeah. Because the whole thing was gonna be that like Sansa was gonna have kids with Joffrey and then end up choosing the loyalty of Joffrey and the kids over her previous family. So the view of that is Littlefinger and Santa might still be on the same side if they're both still siding with the Lannisters with Jaime. Yeah. Anyway, that's a whole theory but, altogether. But I, I officially yeah. said it here first, also, so if anyone says it again in the future, I own that one. Mm-hmm. But I think that overall, <clears throat> I think it's pretty easy S tier for book Littlefinger. Oh, easily. He... Like all of his plans in the Vale going forward, it's it all seems pretty... Uh... I mean, he's pretty accomplished. The the only criticism you could have of him as a character is that you could argue he's a bit of a Mary Sue. Like, I'd say up until Feast, yeah. everything goes his way. He he successfully assassinates John Arryn. He becomes Master Coin. He assassinates John Arryn. He triggers all of the Five Kings. He rises through the ranks. He gets Harren Hall. Then he moves on from Harren Hall to becoming Lord Protector of the Vale, and he murders his wife. And the Vale Lords hate him, but he gets away with it. You have, like, the Lord's Decorant who want to force him out of power, but he allies with half of them, and he tries to bribe others and murder others and blackmail others. And he even has Lynn Corbray act as a double agent and so that Mm -hmm. people who are opposed to him will rally behind Lynn, seeing him as, like, the figurehead of an anti-Baelish conspiracy, even though he works for Baelish. Like, everything he's doing is genius. And even even when he finally does get friction against his plans, which is Feast... He's able to man- to maneuver it, and we don't fully know what his plans for the future are. Could be the whole like the um, Riverlands invasion, conspiracy thing. Yeah, Preston's mm. Preston Jacobs theory. But he's super smart. He's rising to the top. He's an absolute genius, um, and everything's going his way. And yeah, he's a great schemer and a great character. Um, is it almost it's a bit strange of a... that in both shows we have an individual murder their wives in the veil. Also, sorry, there's a fire truck. I'll mute myself real quick. Fair enough. Average American background noise. The siren of either a police I car or an ambulance. I just moved to a new town and there are so many goddamn fire trucks and I don't know why. It's not that big of a town. Does a Laris live nearby? Not as far as I'm aware, but I feel like I should look into that. <laughs> so it, it's a shame Do to... You... Go ahead. This is unrelated to his scheming, right? Maybe kind of unrelated. Do you buy the sickly mockingbird theory? What do you think of that? Uh, I really like that one. Um, I, li- I do too. I like it as a theory that I don't need explained or, or confirmed. Mm-hmm. I like it as a smart background theory, and it could go either way, but I do really like the idea that... that um, for those who don't know, the sickly mockingbird theory is the idea that R- Robert Aaron... Excuse me. The sweet Robin is, in fact, Littlefinger's son with Lysa, um, which is just makes things even more fucked up in terms of <laughs> Littlefinger's plan and so on. Yeah, I do quite like that theory, but I agree that it's a good one that doesn't ever need to be confirmed or denied. So, yeah, we did. I do also like the idea that, like, <clears throat> everybody thinks that Littlefinger's going to kill sweet Robin. Um just to, like, gain control of the Vale through Hair of the Air or just through other means. Um, and I like the idea that, like, 
If he does kill him, maybe then he's accursed as a kinslayer, and then maybe his plans start going wrong. I mean, he's also Lord of Harrenhal, so he's already he's already cursed. He's already cursed. Things are so destined to go wrong. Like cancel out, like multiplying negatives. Yeah, it's a we did sort of have. Then, I was gonna say we did sort of have to rush through Littlefinger a bit just because the stream's wrapping up. Because there is so much he does, but true. it's basically just he can he rises, and he succeeds. And mm -hmm. e even if some of his plans are kind of batshit insane, like the whole dagger thing is one of the riskiest things ever. Yeah. And the only fact he, the only reason he d he gets away with it is because Tyrion in Clash randomly decides not to do anything about it. Yeah, that is one of the bigger plot holes in the whole thing. And another thing I want to bring up is that we were talking earlier about how Littlefinger serves the role of this friendly, helpful, amiable chap, you know. A, friend to everyone best friend to no one kind of character but having re-listened yeah. to the first book a few uh, several months ago um you're very familiar with Pattire. i'm familiar with Pattire. oh n not that audiobook the uh the youtube one david reads a song oh, ice okay. and fire i don't think i could have handled the uh Pattire. Oh, Pattire. <laughs> um but in the first book he's not really the character that he is in later books in the first game of thrones book He's basically the same as Show Littlefinger. He is like a smarmy, mm. arrogant, annoying prick. And it's only in like Clash Onwards that he takes on the role that Gurm talks about, which is like he's really likable and friendly and people trust him. So it does it feels like a bit I of a retcon. That is, I don't think it is. Okay. I think we're seeing him through Ned's eyes, and I think he despises Ned. Fair enough. We see him from through Ned and Catelyn mostly. I think he's don't just we? being kind of a prick to Ned. Fair you enough. also have a super chat if you want to read that. Ah, sure. I'm, I'm also putting this man up to S because he was always destined to be S yeah, since, no, that's since the live stream be. began. Thank you for the super chat from Jace the Ace. He says, my favourite Song of Ice and Fire duo. Big ups to both of you. With a couple of B emojis. If you want to know why there are Very so many B emojis flying about, check out my, um, my anniversary live stream where I watched my old Hot D reviews. The B puns were out of control. Thank you so I much. My anniversary is... My anniversary is the end of this month. I'll have to do a live stream. It, 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 yeah, it'll be um, halfway it's through Hot D, right? Me. Halfway through Hot yeah. D last no, year. My, uh, that was when I started doing Song of Oh, Spire. yes, yes, of my course. My channel started. You're end D of October 2021. D&D stuff. I'm, I'm like the uh, yeah. the British monarch. I've got like two birthdays. I've got my real one and then the, the ceremonial one. So my real one is 25th of September because mm -hmm. that's when my channel began and I posted my first Hot D review. But my ceremonial one is the start of the year because it was the best episode of Hot D video that I posted on the 2nd of January and that's the one that blew up and started like this as a career. So I kind of see that I as see. like the big bombastic ceremonial one because I only had 19 yeah. subscribers when I posted that one. Oh no, wow. the bees have come in. In that case, my anniversary would be like whenever, the day after episode 7 of House of the Dragon aired. That was my biggest thing. Oh no. I love the bee emoji. Chat, the the cool. lone bee dies, but the hive survives. There were so many fucking bee puns, a song vice and bee puns in my chat while I was trying to watch my reviews. It was, oh, my brain. I had nightmares about bees That's that fantastic. night. Also, I do want to go back to that super chat. Um, imagine having us as your favorite duo when Alt Shift X yeah, and Glidus right? exist. I'm, we're not my favorite song of and fire. I'm not my favorite duo. <laughs> if I had a choice to listen to this shit or listen to. Um, a couple of Australians ramble about food. I'm picking the food every know, time. Right, I'm picking all shift X and gliders. But I'm very flattered that you think so. Amen. Are there any other duos out of interest? Uh, it's just it's just um, Swifty gliders and an us, right? Are there other famous song vice and Oh, I guess Interesting Nerd Club are kind I of like a duo. Preston and Red Team, probably. Oh yeah, Preston and Red Team. They're like arguably they're the they OG duo. They were always a duo, duo, but they've become one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're they're the next yeah. big one. We're like third place, I'd say. Yeah. We're like barely treading ones. water. So the yeah. Orge and Biter are the best duo. That is a good point. Somebody said in the chat. Orge and Biter. Which of us would be which? <laughs> um. You would be Rorge because you look you like putting things up people's butts, right? I'd be Biter because I'm I'm hungry a lot of the time. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Radio West. There are more duos than I expected. Yeah, that's fair. Song of Pollen and Honey. 
Ah, nice history of Westeros. Maybe, See, yeah. I guess when I think duo, I'm I'm thinking like two separate channels who do their own thing coming together. So I wouldn't count Radio Westeros because that's mm. kind of like a package, you know. Or history of Westeros. That's like that's like a package. Um, Winds is probably taking so long because you're just writing about bees the whole time. He's going. The, garden, he's... the reason the garden is so out of control is because there have been several hives that have taken over the place. But what would Fire and Blood be if it was about House Beesbury? Milk and honey. That's pretty good. Milk and That's honey. Than anything I would have come up. With. Milk and honey part one, and it's oh. just like an extensive history of how bees breed. And then part two is honey and milk. Ooh, that's where we. That's where we learn about Lyman onwards. Ooh, God, I I was just rewatching that episode of House of the Dragon, and I still am upset about it. That specifically. The rest of that episode's fine. I just don't like Beesbury's death. Oh, I I went on so, so many rants going through my Hot D review. Like, so, loads of great rants, like, really positive ones. But then when I got to episode 9, I was just like... And again, it's so funny because the rainy thing isn't even the thing that annoys me the most. It's the whole episode... Oh, I, don't, the, I don't really care about that. The whole I episode... set up for something later. See, I do. I am. I do dislike it. I think I dislike it more than you. But for me, it's not the main thing. I see it as the annoying ending that didn't need to be there, mm. and and kind of twists her character in a way that it didn't need to be twisted. But the stuff before the the, the council, what they've done with Aegon, Beesbury, all that just Kristen that annoys me more. Oh, yeah. I don't want to go into it because I've I've done this enough times. People don't need. Valid. I, I haven't gone back and watched any of my old House of the Dragon videos, and I don't plan on it. The, you should, the for one, your anniversary. It's a, fu- it's a fun a live stream idea. Yeah, it's fair. It, the funniest thing I've done in a video was in one of the early ones when I was, like, editing on my phone. I'd, like, I didn't wasn't recording my audio separately, so I'd have, like, a video along with it, and I'd, like, put images over top. And in one of those videos, I forget which one, my face just, like, flashes on the screen <laughs> for, like, half a second. Like, <laughs> transition properly. And it's like a jump scare. It's, it's Quinn jump great. scare. The Quinn face reveal. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, my face is in all my old D and D videos. So, if you care, go ahead. Hell yeah! If you want my face, um, also join the patron Discord. My face is on there. One of my patrons made a um oh. a fantasy haven iceberg with like deep lore and half of the pictures are my face. So if you if you care about that, as it should be. I'd recommend not paying to see a random person's face. I would recommend checking out the Patreon if you are interested in the Patreon Discord or um, exclusive videos, or if you want me to make art of you, a Haven character of you, or to make a Haven character for you that even cameos in my videos. Shout out to Boombler. Boombler, I made a, an art piece for my great patron, Boombler, who uh, his art piece will cameo in the Blackfire video, so keep an eye out for someone with an interesting sigil. Another super chat from JCA, so I'll quickly bring that up. Thank you, Jace. Um, also, shout out pushed me to finish my first script. That's awesome. Do Ooh, you mean that's the sh- great. Do you mean the shout out in this stream? Have you been writing your script during the stream, or do you mean the shout out during the anniversary live stream where I think Jace popped on and said, you know, I want to start making videos because of you, and I was just like, everyone go subscribe to him. I, you know, if if you're an, an up and comer, you need that spotlight. You need that motivation. Oh yeah. Um, thank you for the super chat from Cyrello or or Cyrello. Uh, day two of saying Haven's Hot D reviews are pretty good. Thank you very much. I like them. That, that was a whole thing. The point of that live stream was meant to be um, it was meant to be like a cringe thing. It was me- meant to be like we watch it, we laugh, and we cringe at how bad my old videos are. And you know, in many respects, like the editing, the audio, it is dodgy, but they're not that bad. Like the scripts were kind of good. The points I remember, I was like. It just turned into me watching videos and pausing it and being like, yeah, I agree with myself. It just became a giant circle jerk. Um, yeah, they're not too shabby. Yeah, not too mine sh- are very shabby, but we won't go there. I love that thumbnail. With, All right, um, folks, I think I'm probably going <laughs> to have to get going, unfortunately. Farewell, Crindle. Hopefully we'll do another, we can do part All two right. to this live stream where we, we've got like, yes. what, we'll 20 more, at some point, 20 more schemas to get through. Yeah. If you all enjoyed, uh, you can check out my channel, probably somewhere attached to this video. I don't, I don't know. Um, oh yes, in the in the yeah. description. 
Yeah, I had a video last week about Jon Snow coming back from the dead, and this week I'm working on a video about uh, Song of Ice and Fire characters who are cut from Game of Thrones, so should be fun, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, yeah, but thank you very much for having me, uh, Mr. Late Lord Haven. No worries. Um, I mean, let's be honest, no one is watching this who isn't already subscribed to you. That is not... That's fair. I mean, I think more of them are probably subscribed to you than me, but given that it's on your channel... You you have more subs than me generally, and I imagine we have exactly the same like pool of people. Um, you never know. Yeah, well, thanks for coming. Can't wait to do this in the future. Thanks for watching, everyone. Um, as usual, check out my videos if you're a first-time watcher. You're probably not. Like the video to help it spread. Subscribe if you want more stuff. Click the, the bell to get notified. What other uh, generic YouTube stuff do I have to say? Check out my Patreon if you're interested in that stuff. Check out Quinn's channel. Um, I'm working on a Black Fire video. So this Friday, I'm going to release a video about all the houses in the in the Riverlands in CK3, and then a c- couple of weeks after that, I'll release animated history of House Blackfire. Um, there we go. I've done the shilling part. Uh, oh, and before we finish the stream, thank you for the super chat from Coleshot, uh, who said shout out to Fanta Bee Haven, you other sibling laughing <laughs> laughing emoji. I'm not sure. Bad cut that one. I, uh... Alright. Thank you for the shout-out. I am fan to be Haven on my Discord. My other sibling? Who's my other sibling? Is that Quinn? Is Quinn my sibling? Anyway, I've been rambling enough. Goodbye, everyone. Um, be emojis in the chat, please. That That's all I desire. Be emojis in the comments. See ya.